Well, the ship is a wreck, shit stains the deck as Michael Hollow's fellas make more. And Billy is a worry that he's got the scurvy, cause Chris ate all the limes in store. Pirate radio with the ship and crew. We got wind in our sails and the sky is blue. There's a devil up our nose, so much work to do. For the pirate radio. Stugatz, I think we should start with where the shipping container was emotionally when we walked in today, which is there was a very vigorous conversation happening about Ben Simmons because it is so rare in sports that you see something that looks like cowardice and it is articulated afterward in the locker room where Joel Embiid is saying the game turned on Ben Simmons not wanting to dunk the ball and passing it off and we make a free throw instead of two points. Embiid is asked whether he wants to run it back with the Sixers after they lose game seven to the Hawks and he says that's a tricky question. It's only a tricky question if you don't want to answer it the way that it would be easiest to answer, which is, yes, I want to run it back. Doc Rivers is asked after the game, can you win a championship with that point guard? The answer is, I don't know. (laughs) Philadelphia is booing him and booing the Sixers as their season ends. The answer to that question two months ago was, absolutely, I can win a championship with that point guard. Doc said it. He said I could win a championship with that guy. It is such a distortion of the modern game to see a 6'10 player with a unique skill set be somebody who is perpetually playing the game inside out and now doesn't want to do anything at the rim, just wants to pass it out from the rim. And the problem is, Chris Cody was talking about, as Whittingham was saying, he felt 100% bad for Ben Simmons, even as he's a stoic robot and you don't know what's happening inside him. When everyone in the arena and the court and on the opposing team smells your fear and then the internet is laughing at you and you are, your box score is meek. It is, you are wandering around the court that entire series offensively doing nothing. You're just sort of wandering around as a superstar and you're just, you're milling like a guy in produce at your Publix. Like you're just <laughs> milling about. And occasionally you get 10 assists because you got good shooters on your team. But you're just, put it on the poll, please, Guillermo. Was Ben Simmons loitering on offense? I love a good <laughs> stroll around the dairy section of a supermarket. I do. I mean. <laughs> it was so puzzling, Stugatz, because Cody, Chris Cody is talking about We have found our four-tool player, but one of the tools is doesn't want to shoot, can't shoot, and therefore, oh my God, you've got a terrible contract on your hands. It's the worst tool to be missing from the toolbox, is it not if you're a basketball player? I don't want to shoot. Guillermo, put it on the poll, is the worst tool to be missing from the toolbox, I don't want to shoot, for a basketball player. It was hard to watch, because I, of course, this always happens to me, I felt bad for him. Because I'm like, that dude's scared. And now we're all watching it. And Joel Embiid is saying, he's blaming basically the series on, yeah, Ben Simmons had a dunk there and he just passed it up. He didn't want to dunk. He's right under the basket with the ball open and he just passed it off. Convenient from the guy who had eight turnovers last night. I okay, mean, but he wasn't scared. No, he was not scared. And that's for sure. my guess is that he deflated some realizing, hey, my running mate here, <laughs> the guy I'm not sure I want to run it back with. It's a tricky question. My running mate here, can't trust him. I got to trust the Curry brother that isn't the Curry brother that I'd prefer to have. And that's that's my second superstar. Here's Joel Embiid after the game. He's blunt. He's he's honest. He's honest to a fault. Here, here's Joel Embiid after the game. Man, uh, I'll be honest. Um, I thought the turning point was, uh, uh, you know, when we, I don't know how to say it, uh, but I thought the turning point was just, you know, we had a, uh, an open shot, and you know we miss. Uh, we made one free throw, and uh, we missed the other, and then they came down and scored, uh, and uh, we didn't get a good pos- uh, possession on the other end. And Trey came back and he made a three, and then from there, uh, down four. You know, Stugatz, how hesitant I've been the entire time we've been doing this show together to label somebody scared or a choker, but I don't know what other conclusion you can draw from how meek his game was, how rarely he shot 
in the fourth quarter, how often he was just coming down on offense and there was no threat, Stugatz, of some of the stuff Giannis does, which is I'm so long and so strong that I'm just going to do something at the rim because what are you going to do? Like, that's how he played. Right. That's how he played. He's such a confusing player. He's one of the weirdest players in the history of the league because he does all of these things well. Great rebounder, great defender, great creator of threes, the best creator of threes in the league by number. So those three things he does at an elite level, all three of them. And he's really athletic, which is surprising because, Dan, the only reason I bring that up is he can't hit a jumper. He can't work on his jump shot and be able to hit a jump shot with some sort of well, consistency. You do this, right? Because he's such a good athlete. You do this, though, okay? Because you're doing the Shaq analysis. Shaq's analysis is be better or I'll beat you up. And he's working on the jumpers, Stugatz. It's not, he's working of it every day, thousands of times a day. Like, you think that everyone shows up for work the way you do. Right. Which is just like, hey, I'm going to wing it. I don't have to practice. I could just do it this way. He does not. He's, every day there are people watching him and paying him. Maybe he's practicing too much. I mean. He's not good during games at making jumpers in a way that makes people wonder whether he's actually left-handed. <laughs> it's it's a legitimate conversation. People think that he's right-handed. He has said that his father taught him to do things left-handed, but that he might be right-handed. And that might be the next step for him. Somebody might get a gold mine if I'm going to guess Daryl Morey's going to trade him. Even though his value is low, Daryl Morey doesn't sit around with with broken pieces. What would you get for Ben Simmons right now? I mean, I mean, he's value. He he he's still young. He's one of the weirdest players in the history of the league. A, a number one draft pick who didn't make the NCAA tournament at LSU, and his LSU team had a losing record. A, a, a number one overall draft pick that doesn't happen very often. Yeah, I think they got knocked out of the NIT early as well, or didn't play in the NIT. Just a loser. Somebody who's been with the skill set that's amazing. Who has been. A public loser. But do you know how rare it is to watch what we were watching last night where you're like, oh, wait a minute, that's cowardice. He he is short-circuited. His confidence is spent. It reminded me of like Rick and Keel not being able to throw a strike or Markel Fultz sort of. It's unbelievable. The Sixers have had two of those guys. If they took Jason Tatum and they had the chance, if they took Jason Tatum. I mean, Tatum and Embiid. That wins a championship, does it not? I mean, so many people are banging on about the process, and it's largely centered around Ben Simmons, how that number one overall pick didn't work. But this is a team that also took, like, Jaleel Okafor ahead of Kristaps Porzingis. Like, like they've made a ton of huge mistakes at the top of the draft, where if they just made any one of these different choices, they would have a running mate for Joel Embiid. You're right. Seth Curry was the running mate for Joel Embiid last night, and it was almost enough. It should be enough at home in a game seven when Trey Young is missing 18 out of his 23 shots. You can't you can't lose a game seven at home when you're the one seed and you've got two superstars and the other team doesn't. It's such a great point. You got the worst game Trey Young is going to play and you still didn't beat that team at home. Five of 23. Ben Simmons I mean, is part of that. Stu God's Trey Young. Ben Simmons defends really well. He was second in defensive player of the year voting and thought he should have won it. But Talk to me a little bit about, I'm usually the only one around here who feels bad for anybody in those situations where I see what's happening and there's no defense for it. Everyone is laughing at you. Everyone sees that you're shrinking in a way that might as well be physically to the size of a postage stamp. I felt bad for him B. That's the guy I felt bad for. He's out there on one leg trying to carry that team. I didn't feel bad for Ben Simmons. Ben Simmons shrunk in the moment. That's what he did. I didn't feel badly for him. I mean, work harder. But he fairly obviously short-circuited. Like, you never see a awful. moment that is a crystallization What's of someone awful, completely him or your shrink. analysis? Your analysis where you, All of it. you turned your back away from the microphone, apparently ashamed of yourself. I with, was. What, 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 what is your muttered awful about? Was it about Ben Simmons being awful or you felt like your take was awful where you just said work harder and then physically turned your back to the microphone? It was all of it. I mean, if I'm being honest, all of it, I was disappointed in myself. I'm telling a guy to work harder when I don't work hard myself. I mean, all of it, Dan. What do you want from me? I don't 
think it's a work <laughs> issue. I, you know, this is the analysis that Shaquille O'Neal has all the time, right? Where he's like, be better, be more aggressive, be more like Shaq was, because Shaq is the biggest, strongest person in the history of the sport. Be more like, be, be as big and strong as I am. Except when it came to free throws where he couldn't shoot, and Amin told us last week that he would shoot 90% in practice, and the lights turn on, oh no, he's shooting 47%. Right, and didn't probably want the advice then, hey Shaq, just be better. Or work harder. <laughs> Awful. They, they ran a clip on Inside the NBA of Ben Simmons' press conference, and at the end of it, Shaq goes, man, if he wasn't better, I'd punch him in the face. Yeah. Like, like, like that, his, his tactic is always, if something went poorly, punch it in the face. Yeah, that was a decent Shaq by Woody. <laughs> It's that, just mumbling. It, it is. Put that on the poll, Guillermo. Is Shaq's solution to everything, I'll punch it in the face? <laughs> because that was his analysis afterward. If he was in the locker room, I'd knock him out. Well, first of all, Shaq, I mean, <laughs> Kobe Bryant called you a fat ass. You were in the locker room with him. You didn't knock anybody out. Like, he publicly called you a fat ass before a training camp. And you are not someone who knocks people out in the locker room. In fact... Do you remember the Shaq fights? Because he had one with Barkley, and I think crazy-ass Scott Skiles one time went after Shaquille O'Neal, which just seems insane on its surface. Oh, Skiles didn't care. I mean, <laughs> I mean no. Skiles has that reputation. That was such a great moment this week, and we're going to be talking a lot about basketball today. But P.J. Tucker, such a, a funny, sweet moment between P.J. Tucker and Kevin Durant's mom, where P.J. Tucker, everyone knows, is nuts. He's simply crazy. Do not bleep with P.J. Tucker. Like, he he can't guard Kevin Durant, but it had to be an annoyance, a fly around an elephant's tail throughout that series to have P.J. Tucker always sort of in his navel, so much shorter, bothering Kevin Durant. And at one point, Kevin Durant's mother... Spits at P.J. Tucker, and there's a relationship there. I don't remember. They said that P.J. Tucker at one point helped recruit Kevin Durant. I don't know whether it was at Texas or somewhere else. But Kevin Durant's mom says, this isn't football. This is basketball. And P.J. Tucker, who is basically hissing and seething the entire game, <laughs> looks at her and says, I love you. And she pulls down her mask and she says, I love you too. And at the height of tension in a game seven, PJ Tucker melts uh, the way only, the, the way you can only when you, the mother <laughs> of your friend who you love does something adorable. Like he just, <laughs> PJ Tucker he melted. PJ Tucker melted. Put it on. Put it on the pole as well, Guillermo. Did Kevin Durant's mom make PJ Tucker melt? <laughs> It was. It was a, it's a great strategy, I, by I mom. Did, I put mean. this in, put this on the poll as well. Did you know that PJ Tucker was capable of sweetness? Because I didn't. I didn't think he was capable of, of it. smiling. All of it. Anyone other than Whittingham feel bad for Ben Simmons, or was it just laugh at Ben Simmons time? I kind of have a rule that I said long ago that I'd never feel bad for anyone that dated Kendall Jenner. Well, now I feel bad for him. <laughs> it's a rule you have, is it? Okay, it's an interesting rule. Put that on the poll as well, Guillermo. Do you have a life principle? Never feel bad for anyone. Who... <laughs> it's a great rule. I mean... It is. It's a good life principle. I feel bad for him, too. I mean, he said that it's all in his head, right? And so the, us talking about it is only going to make it worse. I think he needs to just get out of Philly and do what Markel Fultz, whatever he did when he left and went to Orlando because he ended up being a whole lot better when he got out of Philly. And um, just, you know, get some quiet time alone somewhere in a market where maybe people aren't going to talk about you every day like they do at, when you're playing on the Sixers. When you say quiet time alone, that is what it is that makes me feel bad for him. That's a bad night for Ben Simmons, to be alone with whatever it is the doubt in your head is, and everyone saw it. Right. Your teammates saw it. Like It's compounded by that, Dan. That's what makes it really bad, is now your teammates are starting to give in to it. Like, and, and, your, and your coach is lending his voice to it, and that has to feel bad. It has to. Everyone is doubting your confidence as you doubt your confidence. Everyone is doubting your ability as you doubt your ability. And it is a fascinating, Stugatz, the evolution of that sport over the last five years has been 
super interesting to me for a lot of reasons. A three-time defensive player of the year. The Utah Jazz, the game passed them by structurally. They gave money to the wrong guy because he can be he can be Terrence Manned out of a series. The three-time defensive player of the year. And one of the greatest distortions of the evolution of that game is that Ben Simmons is playing it backwards. He goes to the rim when he dares to go to the rim because he wasn't doing it in this series, but he goes to the rim with the intent of how do I throw the ball back out? What do I need to do to throw the ball back out far away from the rim? And he's just short-circuited. I, I'm i trying to think of, give me the precedent, because you see it sometimes at the free throw line with guys. You see it now with Giannis. Time to think at the free throw line when it's not muscle memory, when it's not anything. It's just here I am alone with my skill set and my doubt. I'm going to the free throw line. I have time to think I'm not good at this. It's not muscle memory. It's not practice. It's not instinct. It's not reflex. It's I have time to think about all this. Give me the example outside of the free throw line where you've been watching a dude and you know, not you're guessing or you theorize, you know that dude's scared. He's scared. It's not like Paul George, maybe he's scared of the moment, I don't know, or Carmelo Anthony's a choker. You're watching and you're like, this dude might be a coward in this spot. I would say a kicker who's had a bad stretch going out to kick a big field goal. I would say a golfer who's who's not good at putting. Um, those are the two things that come to mind. Forgive me. I was saying basketball because I'm talking about the physical idea of muscles on top of muscles and size on top of size and physical in nature. And so I'm asking you about basketball, not uh, in, in sports where you actually have time to think when you're lining up a shot. Once upon a time, LeBron with the Heat, you he got to the free throw line. You would say, okay, I don't know if LeBron could shoot 60% from the, from the line. Like, it was scary. Is that right? I don't remember that. That wasn't something with the Heat. That wasn't something that presented. Was that something in Cleveland? That's not something I have any memory of LeBron. In the Dallas series, like when he went to the line when they were up and, and it was like, okay, can he try and seal the deal? Like, I, I, didn't, I didn't, I don't remember him being super confident going to the line. Wasn't that Skip Bayless's armor and shield where he's like, he can't shoot free throws now. He, he's not clutch. I, I remember him one year shooting like 67% on free throws. But I, I never remember having the feeling watching LeBron step to the foul line thinking the moment's too big. He's not good at this. He's not going to hit these. He's afraid of this. That's the feeling you have with Ben Simmons. I'm not even talking about free throws, though. And forgive me, there might not be an example. The reason I am keep coming back to the question is because I couldn't remember off the top of my head while I was watching it another time in basketball where it was that obvious to me. This star basketball player doesn't want anything to do with anything that's happening out here. Would you include John Starks in that conversation? Well, I think of him as irrationally confident, even as he kept missing jumpers. He what, kept he, shooting, he, though. He, he went two for 18 <laughs> in that game or yes. something ridiculous like that, but it, I didn't think of him as afraid to shoot. He had sort of the Tim Hardaway mentality of Tim Hardaway, I think one time missed 17 straight shots and he was asked, what'd you think on the 18th? I thought I was going it. It was going in. And Nick Anderson had time to think about it because he's at the free throw line. Yeah, free throws are a different thing. But Nick I was good at free throws. That was the odd thing about that. Like he was, I was confident Nick was going to hit at least one of but those. But that's a good, ex <laughs> that, is a, that is a good example of a time because the free throw line is somewhere all the time. Eddie Jones had the reputation in Miami, of being somebody who shrunk. But I'm not talking about reputation. I'm talking about consensus. You're watching it, and you're like, oh, my God, this is so. There's no one who's going to make the argument on the other end of this that Ben Simmons is not afraid. There, You're not. Who's going to take the contrary position today after watching that series? Fourth quarter, no field goal attempts anywhere. A guy who can cave in a defense the way Giannis can, Stugatz. Like, it was weird to yes. watch. That is not Ben Simmons as a player. No matter what your criticisms of Ben Simmons have been, the criticism has never been. That guy simply doesn't want any part of anything to do with scoring. He's not even trying. He's just wandering around. He's milling about the perimeter, or he's just walking over to a corner with no interest whatsoever in impacting the game in a meaningful way. The Ben Simmons you want is the Ben Simmons that played in the first round against the Wizards. That's Ben Simmons. It's 15 points. It's 11 rebounds. It's nine and a half assists. He plays great defense, but he gives you 15 points. In this, past, in this series against the Hawks, 
Hawks, Dan, he was under 10 points per game. You can't have that. You cannot be the second guy in a team and give Joel Embiid and your organization less than 10 points a game being the number one overall pick in the draft. It just can't happen. Forgive me, Stugatz. I don't mean this as an indictment of you. I'm asking the question sincerely because the stat line is one thing. Did you watch what it is that I'm talking about where you're you're physically watching a dude? Yeah. Like, of course he can get a handful of points just dunking near the rim. I'm talking about how he normally plays where you know that once he gets the ball at half court, it's straight to the rim and everything is going to bend around him because he's too tall and handles the ball too well versus just get to the three-point line, bored, bored, and just hand it off to somebody and then just wander over into the corner like you're someone who's lost his his mental faculties. Like just He's so, lost like, his confidence. But you never see it in that sport like that. Or I never do. Like I'm 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 going to guys not being able to throw the ball back to the mound. Mackie Sasser, Steve Sachs not being able to throw the ball to first base, like a mental short circuiting, unlike anything you've seen. I mean, Ben Simmons after the game, when he was describing the play in question said he was afraid of Danilo Gallinari off the backside blocking his shot. Like, when has anyone ever been afraid of Danilo Gallinari defensively? <laughs> I thought that was the first time, I think. I thought right. it was Trey yeah. Young coming over. I didn't even think it was Danilo. I thought it was just, I thought maybe he was spooked by <laughs> Trey Young's hair. <laughs> Can we put that on the poll somehow? <laughs> Has anyone ever been scared of Danilo Gallinari defensively <laughs> on the backside? <laughs> it is not great for your game seven fortune when your superstar, or your alleged superstar, is worried about Danilo Gallinari and what remains of his mohawk swooping in and doing what? Because honest to God, when I think of Danilo Gallinari, all I think of is he's gonna take threes he's going to take threes and i'm not i don't totally trust him he did have the game-changing defensive play against Embiid. yeah that was surprising (laughs) maybe he should have feared him the way that ben simmons did on the backside (laughs) maybe simmons was on to something (laughs) chris cody's been workshopping a take back here which is kevin herder is doing it for the gingers perhaps the best ginger since bill walton in sports. Yep. Well, wait a minute. McGuire has to be, right? M- Mark McGuire has to be the greatest ginger in the history of sports. Does well, he I, not- I was thinking basketball. In, like, I wasn't really going not into other guys. sports. But in all of sports, I mean, outside of McGuire, I don't even know. He might be. He's up there. What Kevin De Bruyne is crushing tomato? it for The who? Ooh, Sean White. Uh, Sean White. Ooh, flying yeah. tomato. Yeah. Kevin De Bruyne yeah, is doing one. it for Belgium and <laughs> Man City as well. <laughs> Boris Becker is a good one. <laughs> Justin does, Turner? Does Boris Becker count as a ginger? Oh, come on. He's got red hair, man. I Kevin think- Canelo Alvarez. Oh, yeah. Uh, Canelo, that guy. <laughs> Let's just stick with basketball, I think. What is Blake Griffin a ginger? Oh, that's a debate as old as time right there. <laughs> as old as time. <laughs> is it really, Chris? You, as old as time. <laughs> you seem to be convinced that Boris Becker is a redhead. I think of Boris Becker as being blonde. I don't know if he is strawberry blonde, if he is somewhere in the middle. I don't think he's bo- close. We claim him. Okay. Is that is that's that, how we do it around is here? Is that where we are with mm-hmm. Boris Becker? We'll take anyone. I'm going to Google what color is Boris Becker's oh, hair. See, this guy okay. kind of has the thing my brother-in-law has going on. It's like he's got the orange beard, but the hair is kind of blonde. I, I, there, he's a ginger. There, I said Strawberry it. Strawberry blonde is like a whole different category mm. from ginger, I think. Yeah. Like You don't get made fun of the way gingers it's get true. made fun of if you're strawberry blonde. Mm-hmm. Speaking from experience, because yes. I am, stra- I was born strawberry blonde. And, and the strawberry blonde people, they like to make it clear when somebody does make a ginger joke, like, hey, I'm, exactly. not, I'm not one of them. Right. I mean, he's yeah, got like red hair. Yeah, like when I was a little kid, that South Park episode came out where they said that gingers don't have souls. Yeah, and that so ruined my... I really that, distanced myself that, from being a ginger. Yeah, that episode ruined a few years of my life. Is that true, Chris? I mean... That's what they say ever since then. Did you have the reaction I thought you had to how awful the nickname The Flying Tomato is? <laughs> I never heard it. I was like, wow. <laughs> that's the first time you'd heard the nickname and you thought to yourself, that's a, that's, that's a terrible nickname. I suppose it's better than being simply a grounded yeah. tomato. Seems but... a little lazy. 
How about Andy Dalton? Ah, oh, the Red Rocket. The Red Rifle. Oh, right. <laughs> what is it? I mean, oh, what, what about <laughs> Andy Dalton? Something else. What, he's on the list. Wait, wait, on what list? I mean, greatest <laughs> uh, redhead. No, red. people with red hair? Yes, he's on the list as having red hair. Yep. Dale I, Earnhardt Jr. I, 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 I mean. don't think that uh, I don't think that Andy Dalton Jr. Gets to be on the list of greatest athletes ever of any kind at any time at any position. Did Google? Did uh, Stugatz Google a Bleacher Report yes, slideshow of yes, gingers from 2012 yes, again? Of I did. did. Yes, yep, of course yep, he did. Yep. Why do you think he started spitting them out one after another? Red all of a sudden? Range. I mean, I don't, Dan, I don't know if I agree with you. Ghost. I think if you're a starting quarterback in the a, Stugatz, a starting quarterback in the NFL just gets you on that list. Yes. I think. Even though he wasn't that great, like he was a starter in the NFL for a few years. Yeah. And I questioned every year he was a starter whether he was actually a backup for just a cheap organization that didn't want it or care about doing better. And I think you thought that because he had red hair. <laughs> it's I mean, possible. I mean, he made the playoffs, Dan, like five straight years. I mean, you're, what are you arguing? Let, let me let me no, I just want to step back. Let's see what you're arguing. Let's go ahead. Construct the argument. What tell me what you're telling me about Andy Dalton. Go ahead, please. What I'm saying is Andy Dalton has to go down as a top ten redheaded athlete of all time simply because he started at quarterback and not many redheads start at the most important position in sports. That's all I'm saying. Ed took his team to the playoffs five years. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. It's either him or Sonny Jurgensen. Uh, how about that? Bill Walton. <laughs> Steve Martin was was a prop comic. <laughs> Tell me, Stugatz, how many playoff games Andy Dalton won? Because you did the took him to the playoffs five straight times. He won zero. <laughs> oh, and five in the playoffs? Yeah. Ooh, Billy brings up a good point. Dennis Rodman. Andy Billy didn't bring up that point. Billy agreed <laughs> with your point, and then you used it as Billy brought up that point. <laughs> the worm. Andy Dalton... <laughs> Has never won a playoff game? I don't think so. I mean, the Bengals haven't won a playoff game in forever, right? I have to look it up now. I mean, I could be wrong. He, he is indeed 0-5 in the playoffs. <laughs> he lost to the Jets once or twice. <laughs> All right, so let's hear the argument again. Just took his team to the playoffs is now is now the standard. Yes, so the argument is there are very few. There's only two I could think of uh, redheaded quarterbacks in the NFL Andy Dalton, the Red Rifle, started for the Cincinnati Bengals, made a bunch of Pro Bowls, I think, and went to the playoffs five times. Never won a game, but went to the playoffs five times. And because it's the most important position in sports, he's deserving of top ten redheaded athletes of all time. You say it's the most important position in sports. What you fail to sort of assess is the idea of you will find no other quarterback allowed to start that long without winning a playoff game for a franchise. <laughs> like you won't, you won't find somebody else. Right. In, go ahead and name them all. Stafford won a playoff game. Like you're, you're going to have a hard time. You're saying no, Stafford did not win a playoff game. I think I, Stafford. I, think, I mean, the, the Lions haven't won a playoff game in 30 years, so I presume that he hasn't. I thought that there was one playoff victory for the Lion in the last 50 years, and it was Stafford's. I thought I had that right. I may not. I th I didn't think that Stafford was winless. I don't think Stafford yeah, has. It's, a, it's, yeah, it's three defeats from three. For did they Stafford have a buy? Is that what they had? Did they have a buy? That's I, not I, a win, though. I, no, that, agreed. <laughs> agreed. It's not a win. You're absolutely right. It's not a win. A buy is not a win. In Stugatz's defense, Andy Dalton's probably the best TCU quarterback of all time. So if you're the best quarterback of all time at a Power 5 school, does that automatically make you a great quarterback? I think it might. Thank you. Where does Jeff Garcia fit into this conversation? Did he win a playoff game? Oh, he had to win a playoff game, yeah. He had that uh, throw to T.O. that won a playoff game, right? With Mariucci as the coach. Final play of the game. If you go bald, are you still a ginger? Yep. Look it up. We need to update like a month's worth of polls. We haven't updated any of these polls. Should we just do this now? Should we? We really need to do this at some point. Catch up on all of the polls over the course. Maybe we do that in the post game show. Just nonstop polls for however long it goes. The last goes, time we even, did it, even if it's forty five minutes nonstop of polls. Guys, Carson Wentz has been brought up in the chat. Oh wow! I think he's a ginger. Maybe really. Isn't he? Maybe strawberry. Is, is he in he? that strawberry blonde category? Is he good? That, Andy that, didn't, <laughs> didn't he win the league MVP or come close? Wait, Carson, Carson, Carson Wentz? No. Like, 
or, or was he, was that he first on his season? Way? He, was, right. he was on his way before he tore his ACL. I and think. then Foles took over. Yeah, yeah. and then yeah. Foles won the Super Bowl I with a team that million. was so yeah. overwhelming. Big Dick Nick. <laughs> I'm sorry. What? 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 It's a dick move by the show. Not keeping him moving there. We <laughs> <laughs> were stunned. We were all please. stunned. Look how, look how pleased. His nickname. Look at what do you want me to say? <laughs> I thought I didn't realize it was nickname. I thought it was just something you came up with because you were trolling through a locker room one time. Whoa! How else would you know? <laughs> Dude, can I get you to go Dalton better than Wentz? Dalton is better than once, yeah. We can agree on that? We, we got to see yeah. him in Indy first. We got to see what Carson Wentz looks like in, 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 as the Colts quarterback first, I think. You're thinking a little uh, enough. Little, re- <laughs> <laughs> little revival for, uh, for once. The old change of scenery. Ah, uh, nothing better. When's the last time the change of scenery worked? Bill, it's the change of scenery and reunited with Tom the offensive Tom Brady, coordinator. Drew Brees, yeah. does that work? Yeah. Drew Brees went from the Chargers. It was kind of okay there and then yeah. became one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time in New Orleans. Peyton Manning, does that one work or no? Yeah, it works. I mean, he won a Super Bowl. Yeah, that's yeah. No, but the change of scenery is he's a bad player in one place Yeah, and then needs another place in order to get better. So I don't think Peyton Manning counts because he was great in Indianapolis until he had the neck. Well, he was problems. horrible in 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 Denver for that last season, and they carried him to a championship. So maybe it's okay, the but, reverse. But, no, but he like threw for fifty eight touchdowns his first. Yeah, season Yeah, but there. the last season he won a Super Bowl, and they wanted to just say him. you did change yeah. the scenery wrong. It's okay. No, no, no. I'm it's a reverse Tony. change of scenery. It's we'll give reverse. an example, like Markel Fultz change of scenery. Yeah, Markel, I mean, right. I, I don't know if Markel Fultz is going to become a great player, but at least he doesn't have the yips anymore. I believe Whittingham is right there, that Peyton Manning was always great, and he went to Denver, and he was also great at the beginning. I think 13 games in, he was on an MVP pace, and then his neck fell apart, and at the end, he had nine touchdowns and 17 interceptions while they were winning the championship. It does not count. I do love how Whittingham just told you to take the L there. No, just, it's just reverse, ad- Just admit that you got it wrong is uh, what Whittingham said. No. Just admit that you don't understand change of scenery the way he understands no, Dan. change of scenery. It's like an Uno, right? We're playing Uno. I just hit him with the reverse card, and he's got to reverse it. <laughs> but you reverse stunk. It no. did nothing. No. No. Like you, you brought him up as a change of scenery, and then you were trying to figure out a way to make it work for you. It didn't work. Reverse. It was a double reverse, actually. Uno. <laughs> Why does everyone have their own Uno rules? Why can't we all get on the same page in terms of what the Uno rules are? Because the original Uno rules stink. That's why. It's like, a it's a complex game. Like there like there's a lot of things that that, that can can go on. Are you one of these monsters? Are you one of these monsters that can stack a bunch of pick fours on top of each other? It's draw fours, and yes, whatever. I am. Right, that's, that's no, that's not whatever. What are you talking about? Monster. Whatever. If you do that, that's a fine. What's a fine? I mean, pick four. Everyone knows it's a draw four. I mean, you live for yeah. draw fours. <laughs> I was in a game once where somebody had to draw 36 cards. It was What? Ridiculous. That's, That's not How many true. Are in the deck? That, that is, is true. That is not true. That is absolutely true. <laughs> Someone had nine draw fours that they played at the same time. That is no, just no, no, not no. true. No, 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 no. It was like it was an eight-person game, and everybody just dropped draw twos and draw fours on each other and eventually landed on somebody. Wow. Juju is back there rattling a cage, and I don't know where this is going to be. <laughs> Directed, but I believe this is gonna Yo, be the first ever. How many cards are in that deck? You had so many draws. First of all, you're peeking. You're, you're how many draws can you have, Roy? Nobody believes 36. There's only so many in a deck. I mean, there's only so many in a deck. What are you talking about? Roy, don't argue with the chickens. I kind of had to because I was there for it. You don't have I'm to. Not the loudest one. Roy, don't talk over the chickens. Chickens the, have final chickens say, Roy. Chickens are undefeated. The chickens lay don't out, Roy, lay out. <laughs> <laughs> Make the elm. It's a dangerous game, I Roy. Just, I just leave, refuse to. Leave the, no, but what do you do? What do you mean you refuse to? You can't. You, they're undefeated. And it seems clear to the group and the chickens that it, what you're suggesting is mathematically not possible. <laughs> <laughs> Every- it wouldn't be if I said it was a draw 39 or something if he had to draw 39 cards because they're all even numbers. No. There's four draw fours in a deck. <laughs> that's not true. I'm lo- what do you mean it's not true? I'm looking at it. <laughs> Wait, he could have had one of the Uno double decks, though, because some people do play with double decks. Okay, that's eight. That would be eight. All right. Does that How still, many decks were you playing with? Roy? That still makes it mathematically impossible. Yeah. Is is Roy now claiming something? Stay strong, Roy. Well, keep in mind, Stay we, strong. we included draw twos in there. Oh, here we go. So there's that. Oh. How do you play, Roy? Do you think like there is actually eighteen 
it like like it was draw eighteen, but each time you tell the story, it like climbs up by two. It's kind of like Stu Gatz's Devil's Isle anecdote, where every time it gets closer to the hole, I feel like every time you retell this story, it's gone from eighteen to thirty six. No, no, no. It may have started at thirty two and went up to thirty six, but it was it in the thirties. Oh, already it's the draw four. Hey, I'm not backpedaling. So I'm not backpedaling. All I know is it was above thirty. That's all I know. Okay. I believe that when this story gets told ten years from now, there will be <laughs> cards drawn throughout the nineties. It was it, it just, I, spent, I spent the entire nineties playing a game of Uno <laughs> with a full deck of draw fours. <laughs> I did actually. <laughs> I love, I love Roy trying to argue with peeking chickens. <laughs> hey, get back in the cage. Get out. I can't believe it. They were right. Me fried chicken eye. Oh Jesus! Oh, wow. You God. guys know Galileo was a ginger. Wow. Oh, that's Wait, big. Phil Kessel. How did we not think of Phil Kessel? Oh, Phil Kessel's Ooh, th- good. Th- there's got to be some other hockey ones, right? Uh, Mike Commodore. Ah, you have no idea what the f- I'm talking about. The way you're talking uh, about um, Chuck Norris. Probably the greatest ginger of all time, no? The greatest ginger. Of- well, is there if, somebody if, better? If, if Galileo was a ginger, then I think he's got That's Chuck good- Norris beat. Uh, Chuck Norris kicks his ass. <laughs> Literally. That's a good poll question. Who's the best ginger of all time, Galileo or Chuck Norris? <laughs> Put that on the poll, Guillermo. Best redhead of all time, I need to be Galileo or yeah. Chuck Norris. Or Chris Roy Cody. Halliday has to be in there. <laughs> or Roy Halliday. Or Chris Cody. Or Chris Cody. <laughs> Phil Kessel. Oh, fat Phil Kessel. Boris Becker. Gritty. Wait, this Wikipedia Gritty. page Gritty. also says <laughs> George Washington. <laughs> George Washington was a, a ginger, apparently. What? No. 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 Under that powder he always wig? had white hair. Yeah. He always yeah. had yeah. white hair. You. Yeah. Yeah. To believe you, he always had white the hair. The chickens out on that yeah. one from birth. Now that I think about it, I saw a lock of George Washington's hair at a museum <laughs> in New York once, no. and it was Impossible. auburn colored. Mm. Oh, I believe wow. auburn colored. Auburn. Colored. Auburn. Colored. Oh, auburn. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Warrior. Chris, you should say you're yeah. auburn haired instead of ginger. You know. I feel like that's a little bit more. You know. Yeah. Regal. Warden. This is the Dan Lebatar show with the Stugats podcast. Is that Billy Gill? Oh, my God. Hey, Nick, right? How are you? What's up, man? Totally agree on the whale's mouth. Just oh, the guy's shit. full of shit? Yeah, just obvious. There's no way. I mean, that's I mean what, are we, what are we even talking about? How would you make a whale throw up? I don't know. Punching him in the uvula like you guys discussed, I don't think is the strategy. Well, box mm. bag. well what is your strategy, though? I think if you actually get in there, you're just <laughs> But luckily for that guy, he wasn't. I was watching something on Disney Plus this weekend. Man, these whales are big. Yeah. I might have under, underestimated their size. Put it on the pole. Whales are big. <laughs> was it Pinocchio? Because that was fake. These whales are Also, big. maybe tell... Um, <laughs> Jessica, that her species takes are really bad. I'm right here. Just oh, sorry. You weren't face. showing up on my feet. Or <laughs> sorry, you weren't one of the people at the top. I'll tell Jessica. Jessica, those are bad takes. What? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Just, you know. I read a whole story this morning that there's an octopus city named Octlantis. Yeah, that's why in- it was a bad take is you could have gone to Octopi and instead you were like, nah. Squid, right there. octopi, whatever. That's the same difference. They're both smart. Is it our place to be naming cities that are being established by octopi? Seems like appropriation. I think so, too. Stugatz is taking an earned victory lap today. Sports is filled with losers who can be criticized. Uh, Mike <laughs> Schur is confused by Stugatz's yeah. take. He's writing in, so the way to earn respect is to lose on your own, but if you lose, you don't get rings, which is the only thing that matters. Lose with Jeff Green, right? Losing with Jeff Green while scoring 50 points is better than winning with Steph Curry and Clay Thompson. Yes. Yep, I said it. Okay, yep. so here's yes. Nick Wright. First things first. I'm sure he's yes. going to agree vigorously with this. Let's see what you've got, Nick. What is your opinion here? Nick has just emerged. He is demanding yeah. to be heard <laughs> because what? Uh, uh, because Stugatz I is... demanded. Okay. I called in a favor. I was like, I don't have Stugatz <laughs> or Dan's cell phone numbers. I Mike Ryan, who is my personal connection to the show, is not here. So I, I was I, I called the people at Twitter and was like, hey, for 30 seconds, can you make 
Dan, follow me on Twitter. They're like, why? I was like, I got to send them a DM. You can fix it after. So he did. And I, I invited myself on the show. I got a question for you, Dan, as you patronize my guy, Stu Gatz, who has the obviously correct take. Thank you. Do you like action movies? Are yes. you a fan of any of them? Yeah, I like them, but not, uh, you know, not many of them. Right. I, I understand. You're more of a, you know, deeper thought, no country for old men type of thing. I get it. But like Die Hard, you enjoyed it, right? Yes. You know why Die Hard was great? Because it was one Bruce Willis against 12 terrorists. Boom. You know what action movie sucks? If there's four Bruce Willis, two terrorists, and it's like, well, he's supposed to do that. And and that people yearn to see their heroes as underdogs. That is one of the things we like. So seeing and a loss creates a greater sense of awe, fulfillment, and astonishment for many than when it's like, well, he's got three of the four best players on the court. So, of course, they won. So, yeah, this is similar to, for a lot of people, LeBron's 2015 finals loss with Mozgov and Delhi was more impressive than his 2012 or 13 finals victories in Miami. Like, it's not a bad take. It's actually the right take, and I doff my proverbial cap to Stu Gatz. Well, thank you, Nick. So, Nick, no would you say a super team would be like the Expendables in this situation? It's not just the Expendables. Aren't those superhero movies, the Justice League stuff? Like, don't superheroes get together all the time? And we love those action movies. The Fast and the Furious doesn't have a bunch of people that are huge stars. Careful. Listen, I'm not familiar with the Fast and the Furious <laughs> franchise, um, but here's the thing about the superhero movies you mentioned. That's make-believe. We're diehard. It's oh, real right. people. Buddy. So action right. movies you're talking yes. about are real. Okay, that's yeah. right. Jason yes. Bourne that's against right. a lot of people. Right. Bruce Willis uh, or John McClane against a lot of people. John Wick against a lot of people and horses. This is It's a simple formula that Durant fell into, and now it's like, wow, look at what he did. That's amazing. It was great, which is why – like, the guy went over 6 in overtime and airballed the game-winning shot. Nobody's going to criticize him. Because it's like, we get it. We understand you did everything you could have done. You played a brilliant basketball game. And now, if he had zero rings, then obviously it would be looked at differently. But he's already checked. You're just like in, in life or in sports. I, You know what? I'm going to use an uncomfortable analogy, but let's do it. Dan, you'd accomplished almost everything professionally. Except for this. So you wanted to check off this box. It's like, okay, I won all the newspaper awards, had a great radio show, had a great television show. I've done all this with corporate backing. What about what's the box left to check? Well, let me try to do something on my own. Forgive us, your internet connection well is a little said, bit though, spotty. I mean, what yeah. I would say to you and to everybody as we're talking about this is, and I don't know how it is you guys extend your respect for others. I have never questioned the greatness of Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant isn't any greater to me today than he has been at any point in terms of how great he is at basketball. He did not show me anything that I did not think that he was capable of. He's one of the greatest scorers ever. He makes it look easier than anyone I've ever seen play the sport, and it doesn't matter to me whether he's got four superstars or one superstar. He's still one of the best players ever. It doesn't change the measurement or the respect for me one iota. But when you're one of the... Well, Dan, first off, you did see him do something he rarely does, which is carry Jeff Green around, which is carry Blake Griffin and aging Blake only Griffin reason around. I haven't seen it is because he played with Russell Westbrook and he's always played with stars before. This necessitated him being someone who scored more, but he's every bit as great as I thought he was. There's no distinction for me. There's no difference for me. I'm not I'm not surprised that Kevin Durant can score against anybody. The man averages 30 points a game. But what Nick and I are saying is when you have that kind of talent, Dan, superior talent, all-time talent, you don't need help. You don't need recruits. You don't well, need to go seeking a championship like John McClain was fine on his own. Can you imagine if he called in John Wick and Marion Cobretti? I mean, think about it. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. D Dan, I'm not surprised by the scoring. You weren't a little surprised in game five with the passing and in games five and seven 
with the 48 minutes and the 53 minutes? I was a little surprised. Nick, what I'm surprised by is that after that injury, he could be the same player that he was before. That after that injury, he could play those kinds of minutes. But he wasn't showing me anything that... Was he showing you something you didn't think he was capable of? Well, it's not that I didn't... I actually thought he could do it. But I didn't know it. Now we know it. Yes. Like, it's similar to step this. All right, I can't. What am I supposed to keep doing with this as an internet connection? It's I mean, the third time that this has happened. What do we do? Can can we get it to be any better? Uh, Nick, why, why don't you try uh, disconnecting from the Zoom and calling back in? Blow on the cartridge as well. Okay. See if that works. That's how we're going to do it. All right, we'll try and bring Nick back. Because it's odd that I have someone that agrees with me, and here he is getting cut off. I feel like uh, someone sabotaged us. Uh, I do find it interesting that Stugatz is willing when the measurement has always been rings. Yeah. It's the measurement. Mm -hmm. This time the measurement is second round playoff loss. <laughs> it's the, the the definition. Stugatz just made Andy Dalton an all time great ginger category, admittedly, by what? simply getting to the playoffs. Right. The the measurement is wins. I didn't make him an all time great. I mean, as you pointed you made out him top ten redhead of all time. Well, well, go ahead, give me nine others. <laughs> I mean, seriously. I mean, red rifle. <laughs> You're missing an important factor here, though, Dan. QR, quality rings. And right now, KD yes. does not have a ton of quality rings. Mm -hmm. He just has rings. Right, right. He Meaningless rings. He doesn't have <laughs> any QR. He only has a couple of R's and no R's in Stugatz's personal record. MR's. I mean, <laughs> I'm willing to upgrade to MR's. Meaningless rings. <laughs> oh, well, is that an upgrade? I thought that that's where we already were. I didn't think that that was I'm at no rings, rings right now. Okay, now. you're at no <laughs> rings, and you're thinking about based on yes. this, based on a second round playoff loss. You're thinking the of the best upgrading I've ever seen him play, man. I saw the so, fire in so his eyes. Eyes, so you man. are thinking of upgrading him to meaningless rings, which is a step short of meaningful <laughs> rings. Or the highest compliment is quality rings. I just want to make sure I have these measurements yes, right. Quality rings. Jordan has six of them. Okay. He would have had eight if he, if he didn't take two years off. Okay. Right. So, but that is. I thought that that was the measurement. I didn't right. think that Jordan got any credit whatsoever for all of those playoff losses before he got all the rings. Like Elijah Wan does not have quality rings. The only reason he he won those rings was because Jordan took the two years off. They're not quality rings. I mean, they're just... They're Go not, ahead, I'm, Nick. I'm sorry, Nick, Akeem, does a large right. one have any I, QRs? I, well, I listen, first, uh, qu yes, his first one, he had no help, Stugatz. Yeah, Come but, on, it's Robert Ory and it's Kenny Smith. There's no other stars there. That's one of the best rings ever. The Jordan would have won eight straight is obviously a terrible take, but I'm not going to go. I want to be <laughs> team Stugatz here. So it's a terrible take. It's just an outrageous take, and it doesn't stand up to the scrutiny of any history or anal analysis whatsoever. You had him slowing but down after three, huh? Okay. I it, 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 What I was trying to say before the internet stopped me from being great, and now I'm on my phone, I hope this is far better, is, Dan, did you not get a different sense of step this year than you had had previously? We have been having, Nick, this conversation since the Sacramento Kings started losing piece by piece. This When when the Sacramento Kings had Weber and Stojakovic and Bibby, do you remember how year by year they'd lose a piece and then all of a sudden Bibby was a little bit better? St Stojakovic was statistically better, but the team ended up being worse. So, yes, of course, when Steph has to carry the whole thing, he statistically is better and their team stinks. Like that, he, yeah. He's great, but what happens? They're an eighth seed because it happened. Nick, we just saw this happen. We saw it just happen with Paul George. Kawhi goes out. Hey, look, Paul George is better than we thought. Harden and Kyrie are not right. Oh, look, Durant is better than we thought he was. Oh, look, Devin Booker just had a triple-double first time. What was the difference? Chris Paul's out. Of course, if I give somebody who's great all the usage rate, they're going to be great and their team's going to be lesser. Okay, yes, sometimes. And sometimes guys just crumble under it. Sometimes guys just can't do it. Like, the the only question left with Steph this year, we all knew that if you took Steph off the Warriors in 15 and 16 and put Russ or Harden in their place, the Warriors would have been worse. But there was a legitimate question. Was the opposite also true? If you would have put Steph on the 2017 Thunder, the team that – Russ had the average of the triple-double, won the scoring title, led to the playoffs, lost. Could he have done that? Or because he's a little smaller and not as athletic, would it not have translated? It was an unknown. We then got to see it, and it's like, oh, 
He can do everything. You seem to be confident that the, all the great players can do everything. I like to see it. With Durant, we got to see it. Nick, you'll see it every time. Kevin Love was this in Minnesota, and his team stunk. And then he goes, and he's the second or the third best player. And what happens? They end up winning a championship. Chris Bosh did this in Toronto, and his team stunk. Like, every guy in that league who is actually great, give me all the guys who haven't done it when you've seen them crumble under it. But LeBron won with Kevin Love. Like, he won an NBA championship. With, like, Kevin Durant's problem is, Dan, he gets too much help. It's like it's not enough just to have one player. He needs Drake. Raymond Green, he needs Clay Thompson, he needs Steph Curry, and then he needs James Harden and Kyrie Irving. Like, Kyrie was enough. Go in with Kyrie. He doesn't need anybody to score 30 points a game for his entire prime. He doesn't need anybody to do that. He averages that. It's his average game is to be better at scoring than just about anyone ever, no matter who his teammates are. Like, we know this about him. So, to answer your question, I think a good example is Kyrie Irving. Kyrie Irving... It will always score, right? But will you win at all? I guess you're you're making the point is the good stats, bad team guy. I think Durant showed you this series that I know they ended up losing in overtime by a shot. But I think he showed you this series that, I mean, literally, if he wore size 17, which he does wear, that's the crazy thing from this weekend is he wears size 17 in real life and 18 in the games because it makes him feel his feet feel better. That's a real thing he talked about like three years ago. I think the Nets are the favorites to win the title right now with no Kyrie and no Harden. I didn't think that would have been the case uh, three weeks ago because I'm like, uh, as great as Durant is, can he be the playmaker? Can he play 45 minutes in the playoffs? You you, you knew it without seeing it. I, I, I needed to see it. I think Stugatz needed to see it. I don't know how you're so confident of it without having seen it. I don't view sports. I've said this before, right? It's the idea. To me, it's a childish way of viewing sports that to be the child hiding behind the couch who doesn't see that his feet are out. And so someone can see their feet. And because that child believes that no one can see them, that is so I don't need to see it to know that something is so like Kevin Durant is one of the best scorers ever. If I put him on any team ever, Nick, you know, good and well, that team's going to be relevant. Are they going to be championships? good i don't know i still don't know if that would have been enough it wasn't enough to beat milwaukee i don't know that it would have been enough to beat phoenix or or the clippers it was good enough to beat milwaukee yeah okay i the i I, nobody is denying that he's one of the greatest scorers ever i just i think that across sports let me let me ask one other thing because i feel like i'm frustrating you and i don't mean to especially because i invited myself onto your show (laughs) are you it's only it's only your internet connection that's frustrating me it's not your argument and you agreeing with me are are you do you do you feel fully confident that mike trout would be a great playoff performer yes okay Uh. i don't know how you can based on what He's Based gr- on what? He's great at baseball. He's yeah, one- but he- so you don't think there's there is such a thing as a guys who in the crucible of the moment get worse? In small in is. small samples, there are in randomness like baseball. In basketball, there's very little. It's why what Ben Simmons did yesterday and in that series is so confusing. What reference points do you have for someone just totally collapsing everything they've ever been? Where you're looking at something and you can see that someone is scared. Yeah, there's it, usually in basketball the great players it doesn't happen to, and Ben and Ben ate himself alive there. I just the I guess the the kid looking at his feet thing I I understand the the point, but I think in sports we have enough examples of guys who certain guys who get better in the biggest spots, certain guys who stay the same, and certain guys who get five to ten percent worse, which is all that separates the great from the all time greats. That when we get a piece of con not speculation, concrete evidence that, oh, what LeBron did in 2018 with those Cavs post Kyrie, KD could have done something similar. That's valuable for KD. And you you knew it evidently before I did. You were certain of it. I wasn't. Like I I I did want to see it because you're, he was drafted to the team and they got Russ. He then chose the team with Steph and Clay. He then chose the team with Kyrie, and then they went and got Harden. So it's not even like that we had snapshots of it. We didn't even have moments of it. Now we do. We have a, half a series of it against a great team.
Dan, he was celebrated in a way after Game 5 and Game 7 in a way he's never been celebrated before. Universally, Kevin Durant was. Like, more celebrated than him winning finals MVP and winning a championship with the Warriors. But I I believe that's an indictment of the people viewing it, not of him. I I think his talent is so singular, Nick, that I'm a bit shocked to hear you say that Kevin Durant, as the lead player on a team, can't make just about anyone feel championship good the way that LeBron did. You know, when when we knew he was going to lose in the finals but he what did he end up doing he ended up shooting that one year i don't know which year it was where he ended up shooting like 35 percent, but he was taking 40 shots playing an irresponsible basketball for him he, he plays smart basketball he was playing a reckless inefficient basketball but we all felt like he could do that i didn't need to see it did you well yeah well with lebron no because we had seen it in 07 because we had seen it from lebron his first seven years in cleveland i like, you can just say because he's an all-time great, he could do it. Kobe couldn't do this. Kobe couldn't. Kobe tried, he couldn't. Like, Kobe couldn't do it. As great as he was, the three years of Kobe's career, he didn't have a Hall of Famer alongside him. He missed the playoffs once and didn't get out of the first round of the two other years. He scored a bunch of points. Couldn't do, couldn't carry. I felt like Durant showed you it, it bounce here, bounce there. Could have carried them. Through the championship. Your argument, like, so, just to be clear, Nick, your argument is if I haven't seen it, it can't be so. No. My argument is you, that if you haven't seen it, you don't know it is so in sports. You are you are just you are definitively saying you knew it. But the re- the, and- but no the re- I, what I know is his greatness, Nick. What I know is that you're telling me that Kevin Durant, because for 10 years he has never done had never been on a team where he's the only guy because he has never been on a team where he's the only time guy that he can't be an all time great who carries a team. He didn't do it with no. Westbrook. I mean, but they were I, great. Stu God, you know, they were great. What do you mean? He didn't do it. He got further than this. Dan, the last time with we Westbrook, he got further than here with Westbrook. The last time we saw him in a similar situation, he was up three, one against golden state. They lost the next three. And then he left and went to golden state. So he didn't do it. I mean, he got to the finals, but, didn't but he didn't what? do it. He got further than here. What do you mean? Didn't do what? Dan, he didn't that... get eliminated in the second round. I mean, what you saw in game five is something I've never seen from Kevin Durant before. I mean, we're all sitting here trying to so tell God, you. you've seen it before. I, I've never he, seen he, him he, carry around Jeff so Green because, and Blake so Griffin. God, the reason you've never seen it is because he's never been on a team where there isn't a second guy. Right, but we saw it for a night, and he looked incredible, like the best Kevin Durant I've ever uh, seen. So God, he's looked, I mean... I don't know what to tell you guys. Like, he's looked pretty great the entirety of his career under all circumstances. There's also a season where he didn't have a second guy. It was 2013-14 when Russell Westbrook got hurt ahead of the season. And he had he won the MVP that year and had multiple games where he's in the 40s. He, he carried Oklahoma City deep into the playoffs that year, which, considering he was without Russell Westbrook for most of it, was really damn impressive. Hold on. That, that, but hold on. D- to be fair, Chris, that Russ... Russ did not miss that full season. Russ was there for the playoffs. Durant in Oklahoma City played one full series without Russell Westbrook. It was against Memphis after Patrick Beverly blew out, uh, it messed up Russell's knee in the first round against Houston. So I, I'm not sure what year you're talking about in com- in comparison, but Ru- KD only played one playoff series ever without Russ in OKC. It was the second round against Memphis. And he played one in Golden State without Steph. It was against the Spurs, but he also obviously had Clay. I I just it is it is very it is surprising to me, Dan, that like you having watched sports as long as you have are totally discounting the to me you're discounting the mental aspect of expectations pressure and circumstances like i think there is no argument to be made in the world that by an eye test peyton manning is a far better quarterback than tom brady except for the fact that one guy clearly upped his game repeatedly in the big spots and the other guy had some of his worst moments in the biggest spots that's not small sample size luck that is some people rise to the occasion some people don't and for Durant, when there was the built-in, you, the built-in confidence of knowing if I don't have it tonight, my other guys can carry me. That changes the circumstances to allow you to achieve. 
at least to me, and not even to mention just the pure can a guy whose body is built like that play 48 minutes. That you can't say you knew. There's no way you knew he could play 48, and he did it off an Achilles. It's remarkable. Outside of Barry Bonds and perhaps Peyton Manning, I think you're going to have a hard time finding anyone who has historic kinds of excellence that you would James make, Harden. make these claims about. Chris Paul. James Harden. James Chris Harden. Paul. I disagree on Chris Paul. Chris Paul's been great. But what about Harden, Dan? Tell me. Uh, Harden has not been good in the playoffs so far, and I believe that if I gave him a representative sample over the course of his prime, that would correct itself. I, I mean, guys played like 140 playoff games. That's a pretty. That's like a more than a. It's almost two seasons in the playoffs. I don't. I. I don't know. I mean, I. I okay. We just we fundamentally disagree on that. I. We can agree on Jessica's terrible squid take if you'd like to end this on a happy thing. <laughs> why, why is it terrible? Come on, Jessica. You had octopi right there. They can change color. They can ship. They can shape shift. They can do a lot of things. They're a, literal aliens. Pablo ex- explained all this to you guys, and you went squid. Come okay, on. but like a squid and octopus, what's the difference, right? Like squid words, okay, they're all kind of the well, same thing. Okay, well, there you Not go. Like, the, like they do that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Can't argue that, Nick. That's what I Good luck, Nick. <laughs> you know what? I've been checkmated. Jessica, Dan tried to checkmate me for 15 minutes. I kept hitting with karate chops. What about Peyton Manning? What about Mike Trout? What about James Harden? You did it with the squid in 30 seconds. You got it. You got me. So you know that Mike Trout won't be good in the playoffs because you no, haven't seen Dan, it? Dan, that is, Dan, you are, you are arguing in a like I would almost say a political manner here, which is twisting my words. It's not what I'm saying. I am not saying I know something won't happen. I am saying I don't know that it will. I, I'm saying you seem to be certain Mike Trout, because he's one of the greatest regular season players we've ever seen, that that will carry over into the postseason. I'm saying I do not think sports work that way. I would like to see it to know it. I, would I bet on him being great in the postseason? I would. Would I, as I, am I as certain of it as I am with Mookie Betts? Of course not. Of course not. Why would I be? I've seen one. I haven't seen the other. You're arguing about the differences, though, between probabilities and certainties. And I would bet every time on the probabilities of historic greatness being historically great in moments that call for historic greatness. That's what that's how these people get remembered that way. Nick, you're the guy out here who's arg- always arguing about uh, uh, he's always arguing that LeBron is better than Jordan. And both of those right. guys got all of these questions before they proved it to you that they could actually do it. Both of the guys that are in the argument of greatest you've ever seen in that sport got the same questions until people saw it. And then we always back away from these guys when they do it. We always question the guy, and then we can have the outliers, whether it's Chris Paul or James Harden or Peyton Manning. We can have the outliers, but the guys who are historically great are the ones who do it with excellence in the playoffs. And then they show you they've done it, and they quiet all the critics. Yeah, which is why for Jordan, it's such a shame he never showed he could do it without Scotty. I mean, one in nine in the playoffs. Am I right, Stu Gatz? Without Scotty. I'd like to see him win some without Scotty. Um, yeah, but the, also the guys, like, why is Akeem Olajuwon unquestionably greater than Patrick Ewing? Well, their regular season numbers, not that different. It's because one guy upped his game every postseason, and one guy tended to get a little bit worse. What made. Why is Dwayne Wade one of the 25 greatest players in league history? He ever won an MVP? Nope. Was he ever win a scoring title? One, I think. So why is he, without a doubt, one of the greatest players we've ever seen? Because of his finals performances, particularly that first one. Like there is, there, there's, this is, why was Kawhi talked about as arguably the greatest player ever? Was it his regular season success? Nope. He had like two first team all NBAs. Is because when other guys got worse, he got better. That's a real thing in sports. We see it all the time. Look, what do you think, Dan? What do you think of Lamar Jackson? Are you are you fully confident that he's going to have 
what is going to be considered a great career? I or have, are there nervous? I, I have a hard time with him just in general because that it's a different math the way that he plays the sport. Like I, I him in general, he confuses me in some of the same ways that Ben Sim, Ben Simmons did last night. I don't understand what it is that I'm watching with Lamar Jackson because I'm I'm watching a hybrid quarterback who's passing accuracy isn't the it, it his passing strength is not what carries him all the time right but uh, is it also true that sports are a little bit different almost across the board maybe except for baseball in the postseason that not and i'm not talking about pressure i'm talking about how teams defend you schemes all of that like it's the same thing that we 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 have seen that okay if you can build an entire game plan around stopping this one guy, can he still kill you? And I think, I, I to me, that stuff's interesting. And I know all the LeBron folks on Twitter were dying for me. They were tweeting me all weekend, oh, go after KD the way people would go after LeBron, 0 for 6 in overtime, airballed the game winner. And the answer to that is obviously the way people went after LeBron was illogical and you shouldn't do that to anybody. But also, I... Listen, I just I was listening to Gats this morning and I was like, I totally agree with that. I I learned I knew Kevin Durant could was unbelievable at basketball, one of the greatest scorers ever. Him going to Golden State did not teach me anything. This series taught me something. So I to me that's fascinating. I find that's amazing cool. after that series, the specifics. Not only did it teach you something, but the respect for Durant has been so universal and so consensus that the previous guy that you were doing that to, Giannis, everyone ignores that he was kind of great in that game too. <laughs> like it's it's being ignored that the that the winner in that game that you've right. been questioning about his ability to do that in a game seven that he was also great in that game yeah. while playing an absurd number of. Minutes. But we're also telling you, Katie also won in his own way. That's it. There is a difference, Dan. When everyone knows you have to score fifty for the team to have a chance, everyone is geared up to try and stop you, and you still go out there and you give them fifty. I mean, it's a big difference. But he won, and the, you can't fall back on. Uh, Stepper Clay. He, he won the MVP the year that everyone was wondering whether or not he could do that or not. Nick, do you have anything else? Because I am actually curious what it is that you thought uh, the historical precedent of what you saw with Ben Simmons. Like, I I hate doing choke, soft, coward, and I just thought that you're not going to get anyone to plant their flag on defending Ben Simmons today because of how weird it was to see someone who's allegedly a superstar. You have to take him out of the game. Well, yeah, like the – and you guys can look it up. If I don't know when it was. There was a game this season against Utah where Ben Simmons scored 42 points. Joel wasn't out there, and they ended up losing that game. But it was – he had 42 points, almost a triple-double, and was dominant. Now he was dominant against fraudulent Rudy Gobert. There's another guy. Tell your advance – tell Tom – when do you have Tom Haverstraw on? Tell, have him tell me about what an MVP Rudy Gobert is. That's another story. Let me stay on this. Uh Ben got in his own head. I think that's pretty clear, right? And I do think Ben's in a rough spot in that if you took the 15 best players in the league, the two worst to pair with Ben are Giannis and Embiid. If you paired him with Dame, if you paired him with Steph, if you paired him with any perimeter guy, it would really unlock who he is. And Trey was 5 for 23. A lot of that was Ben. But I've never seen a guy take zero shots in the fourth quarter in four straight games. We had Antoine Walker on the show, and he brought up an amazing point. He was like, how do you fall in love with basketball without enjoying shooting basketballs? He was like, that's the that's my favorite thing about the game. He's like, how could you fall in love that, with basketball? That is such a like great shooting? name, though. That is such a great name to summon. Like Antoine Walker. Antoine. Can't, Antoine, Antoine Walker will we live know, several, We noticed that he loves shooting. Will, will, will Never several, met a shot he didn't several like. Several lifetimes without understanding why others don't like to shoot. <laughs> yeah. But it's I, – I mean, I think you I, – I think you have to trade him. I also think that if you're my pal Daryl Morey, it's the, a bitter pill. You were this close to trading Ben for James Harden, and now you're going to trade him for C.J. McCollum? Like, you, if you do have to trade him this offseason, you're trading him at his nadir, right? You're trading him at his absolute low point. And I don't think that's what anybody planned to do, but I don't know how you run this back. I also don't 
if you're Philly, you could have won the title with home court throughout and with never having to beat LeBron, Anthony Davis, Kawhi if he's out, Jokic, KD, Harden, Steph, Kyrie, Dane. You could have won the title without ever having to beat any of those guys. And you were basically pretty healthy. And to blow games four and five the way they did, and then in game seven at home, hold Trey to five of 23 and lose, that is a, that's an all-time bad one, man. An all-time bad one. First things first is where you will catch him, and you should because he knows more than most. Thank you, Nick, for being on with us. Thank you. Sorry for the bad internet connection. I blame Billy. <laughs> if you could have a shopping cart from one establishment, this is the easiest what would question it be? ever. Really? Okay, hold on. If that's the question case, ever. hold it. You, you wait a minute. You had this as a topic. Uh, what like shopping? Weeks. No, I said oh, I won't say the answer. Because Did it get I passed on? I, I said the blank. This place's shopping carts are the Cadillac of shopping carts. Did that you, was my topic. Did it ever weeks. make it to air or no? no. Okay. I, I'm going to guess what Chris is going to say. Go ahead. I have a feeling I know what Chris is going to say. I mean, say there's too. one right answer. It's a clear I mean, so one. So long as it doesn't it's, have those automatic locks it's on target. It. It's Target. He's going to say Target. It's yeah. Target. I mean, that's it. They're the, I do like, love a good Costco one because they're so wide. They're like the wide body ones. I've never been ones. to Costco. I've never been to Costco. Yeah, uh, co- really? yeah but Target's uh, baskets, like, they got they're the firm. wide weir- yeah. wheels on it. They're yeah. thick. Yeah. Like, if you yeah. if you bang, if you if it was like, if you wanted to, yeah, like, you know, try to do some damage with it, you could. And smooth. Smooth. Have you never been to Costco, Costco, or you've never been to like a Costco, BJ, Sam clubs, like a big a place like that? Club. I think a maybe club. when I was like young, I maybe was in one, but I not. feel like Greg I've would be in, a big Costco no, guy. No, yeah. my dad's a Publix. My, they're not in both people. <clears throat> you're missing out. Yeah, you really I don't know. Is it a that, scam? I've heard that those I feel are a little like bit over. Scam. I've heard that you waste a lot. Like you, get, you buy so <laughs> those much, you end up wasting a lot. Those people don't know what Yeah, you're doing it wrong if you're wasting it. Produce you don't do from there. Imagine buying a tire and a thing of ham at the same time. It's yeah, beautiful. there's you're nothing gonna, better. Get that at Walmart, right? Nothing. Eh, maybe, yeah. maybe. Depending on the size of the Walmart. Uh-huh. And they sell you like your lunch for like sixty-five cents. Mm-hmm. Everything you want. Wow. Mm-hmm. I've Hot heard and the fresh pizza. Oh, the pizza's so good. The hot dog for a dollar. Soda. Yes, hot dog for a dollar, and the hot dog's like this big. Mm-hmm. I've heard Groupon has good stuff for that. Like you can get your first year of one of those places for like twenty-five bucks on Groupon. Sometimes. I mean, it's not that expensive though. Well, what's like a full year? For like I don't know. That? That's a good question. I don't know. How's Groupon doing, yeah. by the way? Are they still kicking? I feel like Groupon, Groupon really went on a nosedive after like 2013. I feel like my mom single-handedly keeps Groupon in business. She always is just like, she makes it rain. When you come into her house, she'll be like, like what do you, where do you want to go? Let me see. She like files through a bunch of like Groupon she has. So I just opened up the Groupon app and the first thing when I popped up and it says trending, Sam's Club. 66% off, 25 bucks for the Ooh, year. Wow, look at right, that. I right swear, on the money. Someone said that to me yesterday. Right on the money. Even though Sam's Club, we can agree, is kind of the lesser tier of wow. the big of Really? The big clubs, it needed right? to be wow. said. I'm just saying. Wow. Like, I think it's Costco, BJ's, and then anything Poor else. Or Sam. Yeah. Back to Groupon. Yeah. Most things you got on Groupon were shite, right? Yes, absolute yeah. shite. Shite. What? Absolute Yeah, but shite. they always no keep way. their cash value. Like you always get that twenty five dollars you spent on it back like, uh, if you if you happen to miss your depends. Groupon. Because I do it with like restaurants where you pay twenty five bucks for sixty dollars worth of food and then even if it expires, you still get that cash value, baby. Basically what I'm saying is is like unless you know of a place on Groupon and you know it to be good, if you're trying yeah. a place that you found on Groupon, it probably sucks. Wow. I agree. Wow, jeez, not over here. Yeah. Every time I go to change my oil, I go to Groupon. I was, I was just about to say, they have the best deals on changing oils and or any bucks. work for, for auto parts. Yeah, every single time I and need an oil change, I go to Groupon. For some reason, there's a lot of skydiving. See, I, I, would, I would entrust my life to a Groupon. Get skydiving yeah. out of my life, just in general. Just like, I Why? can't think of anything worse. I, like, if you said to me, what's the last thing you'd want to do on this Saturday afternoon? It's skydiving. Really? There's Dude, nothing. There's nothing. No, I don't want to almost die today. No, I know I drive. I know Woody's looking at me right now. You know, it's probably more dangerous driving to to. The yeah, dri- driving to the skydiving place <laughs> is more dangerous than skydiving. It doesn't feel more dangerous though. Yeah, that's an important f- factor for me. How dangerous it feels. It feels. <laughs> gotcha. I mean, look, you are you're jumping out of an airplane, and only only a contraption is to stop you from dying. Cloth a cloth so, contraption. Yes. And some guys like Velcro that, to me. That's reliant I know he's not Velcro. He's probably. I was going to say you better hope correctly. he's not Velcro. Just the worst. Groupon's wild right now. I scrolled down a little bit. HGH factor, natural muscle building enhancer. Like wow. just straight up buy HGH. It looks like on Groupon now. Twenty eight bucks. 
Didn't they sell you that that one time with that concrete thing that you were taking? That was the another. Uh, that wasn't Groupon. That was another place. CBD concrete? also seems to be big on Groupon. Uh, you've now. never heard the story of no. Billy eating concrete? What? From, from a... <laughs> it wasn't actual concrete. It wasn't actual concrete, but it might as well have been concrete. <laughs> it was like it was. It was a protein shake that was for someone that was meant to weigh like three hundred pounds, and it almost <laughs> it almost killed me, and it it Kidney destroyed stones. my kidneys, from what I hear. Yeah. Wasn't the best. I don't feel like we're a skydiving show. Looking around the Zoom in this room, I feel like there's two people, and Mike's one of them. He's not even here. I, feel like I did Mike's indoor skydiving once. Indoor. That's, yeah, that's different. That's safe. No, yeah, it's not skydiving unless you jump out of a plane. I feel like yeah. Tony and Mike Ryan are the only two people on this show that Tandem. would go skydiving. But y'all can have fun. Now. I'd give it a go. Really? All right. Yeah. Whitney's, Whitney's on. All right. Nice. I, I don't I, think Mike would go skydiving. Really? I could see Mike. Yeah, I don't see Mike skydiving. That's no. Cool. All right. Me and Whitty. All right. So I was when right. About you, so I was right about you. Yeah, remember I told you I, I was. Let's let's go skydiving. I do and remember. You do you think, do you, no. think, you think you graduate from wanting to skydive when you have kids? Because I, well, I've never wanted to, but maybe that out. could be that could be a factor. Like Dan's definitely not skydiving. I don't know. Ooh, BJ's forty bucks for the year. Hmm. Fifteen more than Sam's Club. What about hot air balloons? Yeah. No, nah, I like a nice hot sky- air balloon. I'd rather skydive than that. Oh no, I really? Think I'd rather go in an air balloon. Yeah. I've often thought, like, if I go on a plane, if I should just buy my own, like, personal parachute, just in case things go south, I'm ready to ready to bail if I have to. You know what I mean? Now, Billy, then earlier, <laughs> earlier, I was very jealous of your invention take. I thought it was a, an absolutely incredible take that it was Thank much you. easier to be an inventor. It went absolutely ago. nowhere. I, I mean, it should have because that was a great <laughs> yeah, take. At least you tried. But it's a truth. It's a fact. Who do you who do you think was the first person to come up with the concept of a hot air balloon? as a means of travel, right? Let's propel ourselves into the air using hot air. And what ideas, like, didn't make it? Like, you know, if that was one of their because, ideas, they probably had to have a bunch of Because somebody had to be the first person that went into the sky in a hot air balloon. Like, I've heard this before. Like, the, there had to have been a first person that decided, I'm going to drink the milk of a cow, right? And that first person was a bold man, right? Mm-hmm. Or woman. Or right? woman, yeah. But either way, that person had a remarkable amount of fortitude in order to think, I'm going to drink the milk of a cow. Now, someone also had to be the first person that decided, this basket, I don't know, what, what, what do you call, what do you call the it's object underneath the hot, a wicker basket. wicker basket. Someone had to go up into the sky in a wicker basket, propelled by hot air, and decided, I'm going to try this. This I might put work. the person's name in the chat. It's, it's a you name. Oh, Jean-Francois. What the hell is yeah, that? Yeah, that's wow. We reached the name you <laughs> yes. couldn't say. Got him, Billy. Leaning the, lean into the camera, bringing his glasses Jean- down a little bit. Yeah, yeah we're like lower, lower, them, lower them to the bridge of my nose here. Jean Francois Pilate de Rosier. Ah. I haven't told you guys that on my honeymoon in Africa, the hot air balloon caught fire. The, what? <laughs> yes. What? A, I, hot I, air balloon you were in? Yes, the one I'm I in. I thought you were in Hawaii. No, I went, I stopped in Hawaii on my way to Africa. Ah, just a long, long way stop. around. Out of the way. I, you know what? Actually, forgive me. I got my timeline screwed up. You're right. I got, uh, I went on my honey, honeymoon. I went to Hawaii and then Japan. Uh, Africa is when I got engaged. But. The hot air balloon was going over the plains of Africa. So you are basically, there are animals beneath you, Jesus. animals that can eat you. And I look up, I look up, and the the balloon itself has a hole that is growing, that is growing because it is on fire. That is correct, over an African plain. And the guy seemed like it wasn't the scariest thing That's in the, the world. Key. It's like looking at the flight attendant, making sure if they're not panicked, you're good. And they were not panicked, but we absolutely did crash land near some dung, near some fresh <laughs> animal. I don't know what animal it was, but the basket ended up sideways, just sort of spilling us out into the what? African what? plain. Yes. You heard yes. a hot air balloon crash? Yes. It wasn't a crash. It was it was a land an accident. It, it was a landing that made the the basket supposed to land flat. It did not land flat. It landed and then went to its side and spit us out. And my head ne- ended up near some fresh animal dung of some sort. When does when does poop graduate to dung? <laughs> when you're in the African plain. <laughs> How many times have you been in a hot air balloon? Is that the first? I think somebody uh, told a story of being in a hot. It was either you or Stugatz. 
Stugatz also claims to have been no, a hot Stugatz air balloon says, crash. Yeah, Stugatz says on, uh, during a romantic adventure that his hot air balloon ended up in a tree with his wife, Abby. I don't think I've been on a hot air balloon other than t- that time, and that may be my last, obviously. So, that did not go the way that I wanted <laughs> that so, to go. So what happens after you land near the dung? Does, like, the, does we just the went air- to breakfast nearby. <laughs> just, uh, just, it was a romantic breakfast okay, but like, nearby. But like, was it near where you took off from? It that was, way, yeah, like, well, okay. we, land, we landed where we were supposed to or close to where we were supposed to land. It wasn't like a panic situation. Stugatz, they were asking what the situation was. Was it your honeymoon or when you were proposing that you ended up in a tree? in your hot air balloon. I did not propose in a hot air balloon, but I did go on a hot air balloon trip, a ride in San Francisco, Northern California. On my honeymoon, we got stuck in a tree. <laughs> and I haven't been back since. I mean, to the entire area, by the way. You just avoided the entire, yes. not just the tree, yeah. not just hot air balloons. You've, av- <laughs> you've avoided the entire West Coast because of the time that you ended up in a tree. Witty has yeah. me thinking now, we were talking about people inventing stuff. Like when they were trying to invent flying, there must have been some ideas that didn't work. Yeah. Right? Like, all right, maybe this will work. Instead of putting hot air in a balloon, let's, you know, I don't even know what the ridiculous idea oh, is. Haven't you seen seems. like some of those things that just bounce up and down a lot, like really fast? <laughs> yeah. Like the plane like models before they figured it out are ridiculous. I imagine just someone on a bicycle trying to get it, like like it's a bicycle propelled, and like there's a thing that flaps. Like they're like the, you're right. The ideas on the cutting room floor for flying. I don't have anything better than what you offered, but I do love that you went straight from. I wonder who the first person was to take flight in a hot air balloon to the first person to drink milk, as if it was the same kind of danger. <laughs> like I, I, I love that the second and and you're not wrong. Like it is. Wait a minute, this cat. Now is excreting something from its udder. Let me drink that. It the first person who did that did show some bravery. I mean, bad milk is a dangerous game, Dan. It spoiled is. milk. But he's not talking about spoiled milk. He's talking about the first person to have tried milk oh. ever in the history of milk. I don't know why you have milk coming out of a cow spoiled. <laughs> is there any particular reason? It's the freshest possible milk. It's, it's already the unknown. Cheese. That's all I'm saying. You're the first one. It's the unknown. It was probably yeah. warm right. though. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't say that the first person to drink milk from a cow was brave. I think it was like the crazy person of the town. It's like, you know what? Fluids coming out of this animal. Let's drink that. And they're like, "Mm, I don't know about that, Tim. I don't think we're going to be drinking that stuff coming out of that animal. And then sure enough, Tim's like, I'm telling you, I feel so strong now. Look at all this calcium. And then like, okay, we'll try it. And then it caught on. Do you think they also tried pee first? They're like, well, if the milk's good, maybe. Poop, all kinds of stuff. Little, yeah. Drink a little pee. Billy, would you do me the favor, please, of no, telling I'm not me more anything out of an animal. about this Tim? Oh, there's Tim a Tim Milkman. in every crew. Yeah. God. Yeah. yeah. Everyone I, knows a Tim, right? That does the thing that you're like, I don't know about that, Tim. I wouldn't be doing that. I'm and then not- every once in a while, Timmy hits one out of the park, and you're like, oh, okay, cool. Timmy invented candles. I imagine they had dry cereal first, and they were like, man, we just need something to go with this cereal. And they so were the like, cereal came before the milk. So right. you have cornflakes. You, have you, have water. Water. you didn't use water. Let me, let me just be clear on this. You've got somebody walking through an old town, okay, with some raisin bran, a bowl of raisin bran. Hey, I invented this. Say, you know Anyone what? got any liquid? Water doesn't make this better. I don't think. What about that cow over there? What about, you think maybe something in that cow? Cow's udder would make this raisin bran taste a little better. We're laughing, but this had to have been the brainstorming <laughs> session for milk, right? I don't know. It, well, no, it was not. Absolutely it was. not. It was. it was not dry cereal. <laughs> I'm going to go in. Which, would, which do you guys think is first in terms of consumption, cereal or milk? Put it on the poll. <laughs> <laughs> Put it on the poll, Billy, at Levitard Show. What was the first thing consumed by man? Milk <laughs> <laughs> cereal raisin bran Welcome to the Big Suey a podcast exclusive ah, risky move just when you thought the show could not be more diluted walk the plank bam no more free Disney trips. Now here's the marching band of nowhere. Matey. Fat face. Ah, dance been stress eating. And the habitual liar. Ah, Stugats can't be trusted. The Big Suey. Yo ho, yo ho, a pirate radio life for me.
if you want a lot of Ben Simmons talk, and many of you, I think, today are talking about Ben Simmons, you will get it in the local hour podcast-only form. Pardon my voice. But I wanted to start, Stugatz, with the Utah Jazz because I found what happened to them before the weekend started to be super interesting because all year long, they were a great team that was doubted. They're a great team that you're only used to seeing lose at the end, whether it's John Stockton, Carl Malone, whatever history it is they bring into a series, you're never expecting them to win the championship at the end. And it's not even fair to them, right? Because No, it's not, because those teams with Stockton and Malone, a bunch of guys did not win championships merely because Michael Jordan was playing during their time, and those were two of the guys, and that was one of the teams. But to hold to hold Carl Malone and John Stockton against Donovan Mitchell is a silly exercise. It's a totally different time thing team. But the thing that I found interesting, as we found the entire last 10 years of basketball fascinating. And as sports radio is built on this coach did the game pass him by at some point, this legend, we criticize everyone did the game pass him by. And largely that criticism is almost always flimsy or stupid. But when a game evolves so much, that you have suddenly the realization, my three-time defensive player of the year that is a building block for everything I do in the regular season and is a source for why it is I'm good in the regular season can be minus 24 in an elimination game and needs to be taken out of the game in a way that is super obvious and should get Quinn Snyder fired. But what you saw from Doc Rivers and Quinn Snyder is basically – this is the blueprint that got me here, and I'm going to dance with the, you know, that saying. I'm going to dance right. with what brought me here. I'm going to trust what it is that I have. Even if it seems obvious to everyone, I need to get Simmons out of the game. I need to get Gobert out of the game. Both coaches stayed entrenched like, no, this is these are the best players that I have. This is where my money is being spent. I'm not taking them out of the game. And next thing you know, Terrence Mann, he's not that good. It's a nice story. It's a great story. It's just wide open threes because he needs to be out of the game in a way that's obvious. When they put five three-point shooters out there, Rudy Gobert can't play. Uh, And that's what the Clippers did. Uh, And Kawhi's hurt as well. And so it was just a bad loss for Utah. I thought Utah was going to win that series. I'm surprised they did not win that series. Uh, But you're right. Gobert played 42 minutes. And if you're Quinn Snyder, you have to do something in game there. You just have to make an adjustment and realize that guy's not going to work, and he's not going to work against Terrence Mann for whatever reason. And he never took him off Terrence Mann. But Stugatz, (laughs) think about that for a second. Think about what it is that you're saying there. Your structural blueprint is around a defensive player of the year that has quickly become a dinosaur the moment that you get to the playoff and he's got the worst plus minus on the court, and he's making a superstar out of a guy who's not a superstar simply because that guy is taking practice gym jumpers because the game has evolved yeah. beyond what is your structural your structural centerpiece. Mm-hmm. So I want to talk some about what it is that happened there because I found really interesting Stugatz in three different series. In that series, Kawhi goes out, Paul George reinvents himself. Yeah. You saw yesterday Devin Booker, first triple-double with Chris Paul out. You saw Durant all of a sudden gets more respect from Stugatz because everyone's hurt. And I don't think those guys are actually stepping up. I think their teams are getting slightly worse and their numbers are getting slightly better because their usage rates and they don't have to share the ball with another superstar. So Paul George is in a better position if he's allowed to be the guy who is always with the ball. Your team's going to be lesser. Right. But we question whether or not Paul George could be the second guy on a team. And but you it's harder. NBA cha- and he I'm was saying, the first guy with I'm, Reggie Jackson but, and Terrence Mann. But what I'm telling you is it is harder to get the numbers and the reputation as the second guy. You're right. It is usage rate. What you just saw from Durant, the reason you just saw unprecedented stuff from Durant is why. There was no one there to get the stats from him. Harden couldn't get past anybody. It was almost weird to watch 
James Harden played that way where he simply couldn't blow past anybody. He couldn't go get anything at the rim because his hamstring wouldn't let him. And so what ends up happen, happening, Durant gets what you want from him, which is go be a superstar who carries the team. Oh, and also be a superstar who's out in the second round because you lifted all you could lift, but your team's not actually as good when you're playing that way, when you don't have people to share the load who are almost as good as you are. Yeah, but he almost pulled it off by himself. I'm not saying that Kevin Durant doesn't need help. I'm saying he had the proper amount of help in Oklahoma City with Russell Westbrook. Like That's all I've ever said, Dan. He obviously, every superstar, even LeBron James, even Michael Jordan, We'll talk to Scotty Pippen later today. I mean, talking about being a number two guy, right? But every guy needs a superstar. It was just nice to see Durant put a team on his back because, Dan, that's what he's capable of. That every single night. It's not all you've ever said. Well, and it kind of is. So. No, here's Mike Schur. He is asking because he's on the edge of his seat. He's yeah. saying this will be fascinating for Stugatz. His Durant takes are A, he should have stayed in OKC and won a championship by himself. That way he'd earn your respect. And B, his championships with super teams are worthless because he should do it by himself. Now Durant was on a super team with two other stars, but who were both hurt, and Durant did do it himself. Greatest Game 7 stat line in NBA history, and they still lost. I am on the edge of my seat waiting to hear how he stitches all of these inconsistencies together. I've never respected Kevin Durant more than I do right now. More than I did right after that Game 7, Dan. That was breathtaking. That was amazing. The way he played in Games 5 and Game 7 was absolutely... That was some of the best basketball I've ever seen a player play. And that's all I've ever wanted to see Kevin Durant do. And so, to lose in the second round. Well, Dan, yeah. That's, that's all you've ever wanted to see him do, lose in the second round. But if James Harden doesn't have the hamstring or Kyrie doesn't have the ankle, we all know the Buck. I mean, the Nets are still playing today. That, and they probably win the NBA championship. But it was nice, at least for a couple of nights. I'm telling you, I had more respect for Kevin Durant after losing that game seven than I did after any win he had with the Golden State Warriors. I'm telling you, I did. In fact, I'm thinking about giving him back a championship. I am. What? In my per I'm thinking about it. I'm not there yet. Oh, okay. It's just a thought, okay? That's how good he was in Game 5. That's how good he was in Game 7. He was out there pretty much by himself, and he was amazing. And almost beat a really, really good Milwaukee Bucks team. That's, almost. That's always been your standard, the almost beating somebody in the second round. That's Listen, the almost winning by yourself sometimes, Dan, has more value to me than winning a championship with a bunch of superstars. You know what I mean? Figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Figure it out. Well, okay. you can answer I'm, yes. I, I, I assume know, that was a do, no. Do I you mean. know what I mean? Figure it out. Yeah. So explain to me what you want me to figure out exactly. Sometimes, Dan, Give me losing. all the other times that's so. It's going to be Damian Lillard and who else? Anyone else? Because you don't celebrate Michael losers. Jordan, first season against the Celtics. That was crazy impressive. They lost, but it felt like he won everything that night. You know, he had 63 points, I think, in the Boston Garden. I mean, there's other examples. But, Dan, when you take Kevin Durant and that kind of talent and you put it alongside Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, and Draymond Green... You know, it's not that impressive. But when you're out there doing it with Jeff Bleeping Green, pretty damn impressive. Losing in the second round. I mean, yeah, but he won. I mean. <laughs> but he didn't. I guarantee you, Kevin Durant has never felt this type of love. You ask Kevin Durant if he feels like he, if he won or lost. Seriously. Because I'm telling you, deep down inside, Dan, in places he doesn't talk about at cocktail parties, he's going to tell you, I'm telling you right now, hey, that felt great. Everyone celebrated me for three consecutive nights. I was out there. It wasn't my fault. wasn't KD's fault. It was everyone else's fault. It felt great. It felt like he won. He, he said otherwise. Big winner. He, he did say the lying. opposite. He said the opposite. It, it felt that. good, right? Okay, but yeah, he, you know, he feels, Dan, he hit otherwise. the shot to win the game too. If it wasn't for his toe, they would have won that game. He right. won that game for them. Big toe. That was a win. Yeah, those feet are unbelievably large. Yeah, he's got size seventeen feet. He wears a size eighteen sneaker because he thinks that's more comfortable to play in. Yeah, if he had worn. A shoe size that was the correct shoe size of 17, I think he ends Milwaukee season. <laughs> Should we be counting shots from where the feet are or from where the shot is taken? Right? Because if oh, his what? arms are further back, <laughs> let's say he was a yeah. size 10, right? He's hitting that six, seven inches behind the line if he's a size 10, right? Just based on where the ball was released.
That's where it should count from, not where the tips of his toes are. Billy, can, punished. can I tell you how much I appreciate you helping us with the visual aid pantomime there of you taking a Durant Wish jumper, basketball. going back in your chair and taking a Durant <laughs> jumper back there? I, I really enjoyed. So you're saying it shouldn't be where your feet are. It should be where your hands are and where your arms are. Okay, very good. He's taking his headphones off now, and now he's doing a fadeaway, what it looks like. Hit the fan with a racquetball. I mean, Dwayne Wade did hit a game-winning three-pointer. He leapt from the uh, three-point line, and he ended up releasing the shot from the top of the key. <laughs> it feels like cheating. I, mean. I think my favorite moment, Dugatz, in all of these press conferences and all of these Zoom conferences afterward was Donovan Mitchell, his season over. He sits in the chair, and he is handed the box score for the game and twice he repeats something before it's actually started where he's looking at it and he's like and he's looking at Terrence Mann's stat line clearly and he says <laughs> he mutters under his breath he missed six shots <laughs> twice, 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 he says it twice because he doesn't he's not sure his math is right he's like he, he, he wait a minute he shot that much we, we, we're out there with this big giant ogre in the middle of our defense with those long arms our whole thing is built around this three-time defensive player of the year he was better than Kawhi. <laughs> he gave everyone the virus touching a bunch of microphones gobert is this thing that we've built around Around and Terrence Mann <laughs> missed six shots. And one of the other things that I enjoyed, what an assassin this was to have this in your life if you're Quinn Snyder. We've marveled over the years at the way that the, the relationship he has with lip balm. It's aggressive. It's an aggressive relationship. Mm-hmm. And he, he sort of rubs his lips the way that someone cocaine might rub their face. We see a lot of this in Miami where you're sort of, it's just, it's a super aggressive way to apply lip balm. But what I loved is a video where I think it's an assistant coach because it's just an arm with what looks like a suit on it, reaches out with balm. He aggressively grabs it, wipes his lips with it, never says thank you. Because that's Quinn Snyder's life. Somebody just appears with some lip balm, and you don't even have to thank them for it. They just know that their job is to come and apply, come and help you not have dry lips. While setting up his defense, he doesn't have the eight-tenths of a second to thank the assistant coach for he the does lip balm. At, at some point there, they were trying to make his life very efficient so that he would have the time to think. Enough time. Hey, I need to get this ogre out of the game so Terrence Mann doesn't end my season. <laughs> He's 15 to 21. <laughs> Utah's great all season, and I do great. wonder, Stugatz, if they if they have to go home at the end of that and be like, well, wait a minute. Like, we've got something structurally wrong because if Terrence Mann can do it to us, wait till we face a team that realizes, hey, we've got five three-point shooters who aren't Terrence Mann. <laughs> But the amazing thing about playoff basketball is that last night the Philadelphia 76ers would have been better off playing George Hill than Ben Simmons. The Utah Jazz would have been better off playing Derek Favors or Royce O'Neal as opposed to Rudy Gobert because of the specific way that the game plays out. But if you're the coach getting paid all that money, you have to do it. I mean, you can't stick to the game plan. It's playoff Stugatz, time. It's very easy. I get it. You're, you're, you, I mean, Stugatz, you win all arguments because they lost. I also understand, Stugatz, imagine if you do it and lose. Right. And people are wondering, because Popovich did it. He took Tim Duncan out of a game, and then there was a rebound, and they lost the championship. And Popovich got crushed for what the hell are you doing, Popovich? If you lose, Stugatz, you get to win all the arguments the next day about what the coach should have done. Right. You're asking for a specific set of ballsiness. Like, you're asking for something. Take one of your best money guys. You're giving the max to that dude. Mm -hmm. Take him out and just put in random guy because the structural blueprint is broken because you've given money to a guy because Whittingham's absolutely right. You put anyone else in that game, 
They were up by 20-something points at the half. They lost by a dozen, the Utah Jazz. But a coach's job, Dan, I understand what you're saying, is to give his team the best, best opportunity to win the game. And if that means sitting Rudy Gobert, paying him a lot of money, then that's what it means for that specific game. And you tell Rudy that up front, hey, the matchups might not work out for you tonight. I might have to sit you. You might only play 20 to 25 minutes. You are absolutely correct. And every time that an athlete complains about politics ruining their career, that's the reason right there. Because the organization structurally has paid someone else in that spot to be valuable. And the uh, and the athlete complaining about politics is saying, well, on merit, I should have gotten the opportunity. And no, the opportunity goes to your highest paid employees. Like that is... And, and yes, I would love to see coaches that are so brave with their leadership that they would say, bleep it. I don't care what my organization is paying anyone. I don't care what is said to be my value. I don't care what got me here. I'm going to now go Derek Favors. You're asking for something that not a lot of coaches are going to do. Well, I'm I'm asking coaches who I believe have job security. Like, I think Quinn Snyder has some job security there. I don't think he's getting a fight. And Doc Rivers. After that, that, what happened in that game, Fugats, was so overt and so obvious that it's a fireable offense to take a look at what happened there. And you kept riding a guy where you're allowing a team to end your season taking practice gym jumpers. Right. But, Dan, these coaches did the easy thing, and they're still being criticized. So you're saying, hey, make that decision. It doesn't work out. You're going to get criticized. They get criticized either way. Uh, But I'm not talking – you can't make any decisions with the fear of criticism because once you lose, it doesn't matter what anyone else is saying in terms of criticism. I'm simply talking about how difficult it is to go against – trusting the people who got you to where you are i'm just talking about the managing of people never mind the organizational pressure of of this is who we value please play the people that we are paying i'm talking about the specifics of how you lose a locker room and ben simmons forever if in a critical spot or rudy gobert a centerpiece as a manager of people if you tell everyone hey sorry highest paid employee sorry Got to sit you for the second half of our most important season, our most important game, because I don't trust you. And I'm going to tell everybody I don't trust you. I think with the players, though, you actually gain equity. You do because you're doing you're giving them the best chance to win, even while making the hard decision. I think with the fans, that's a tricky one. But with the players, they're saying, hey, coach is doing what he has to do. It's a better matchup for us. But you're not applying your sensibilities to this. What if somebody were to come in here and say, hey, Stugatz, the show's better without you. It's just better you're, I, we understand. It would hurt, but yeah. I'm saying, but it's just better without you. Never, sorry. Apologies, but everyone now knows it. Everyone in your locker room, everyone in your arena, no, everyone, but- everyone watching. The coach has now said, "We understand we're paying you a lot of money, but we absolutely do not trust you here." This is a game, one game in which the matchups did not favor Rudy Gobert. So there are certain shows and conversations where I absolutely sit out on because I know you're going to have a better conversation with someone else about the particular topic you're talking about. I do it all the time, Dan. I do because I want to win championships. You want to make money. What are you talking about? Well, that about? too. But I mean, listen, you're, you know, when you're on certain topics and you're talking about certain things and you bring in, you know, back at ESPN, it might have been Mina or Sarah Spain or Dominique or Bomani, I would get out of the way because that conversation between the two of you is going to be far better than the one you and I would have about it. So I sit. That's what I do. I don't play 48 minutes that night. I give you 22. That's what I do. Small windows. Championships. We've won a few, Dan. Team guy. Yeah. Huh. Boxed you in. You boxed me in. But, the, like, the the amazing thing with these decisions is the specific decision to say, like, Ben Simmons, like, sit out tonight. Because you're not, you're like, you're not only wrecking his value for future series, but you're kind of wrecking his value around the league, right? Now, him being bad also will probably wreck his trade value. But, like, if Quinn Snyder takes out Rudy Gobert there, you're basically saying, we can't win with you. And Stugatz, all the time, your take on NBA basketball all year long with Brooklyn was, they've got the best players. That basketball is a measurement of your best players. And if you go into a series analyzing Utah, you're saying, all right, it's Conley, Mitchell, and Gobert against Kawhi and Paul George, who's better? 
and you include Gobert in that conversation. Like, the idea that you wouldn't play your best players in basketball, of all sports, is kind of ludicrous. But he gets to win all the arguments the moment Utah's season and Philadelphia's season ends in disappointment as a one seed. There is... There, there is no rebuttal to that. Everyone gets to win arguing that the Utah Jazz and the Sixers should have done blank because that hypothetical always wins. It never gets tested. The hypothetical, you have the losing example that has failed. That's why I go to it. And, and the other example is bulletproof. And I just say it's harder as a leader to do the things you're talking about. Otherwise, Doc Rivers or Quinn Snyder would have done them. <laughs> that's the reason they well, didn't. don't lead man i mean this is a life you signed up for you signed up for a life of leadership do the thing your job your primary job as a coach is to regardless of ego and all that stuff give your team the best chance that's it quint snyder did not do that doc rivers did not do that they should be ashamed of themselves they really should it's show some courage. It's one of the, it's what Stugatz gets to do today on the graves of everybody. And for the rest of time, like yeah. it's the wheelhouse for the rest of time. Loser doesn't know what they're doing about anything. I get to be right. Why? Because they just lost and no, and no one will remember six months from now when I have a different take that is, that runs counter to that take because they lost and you get to win all arguments today. You have to recognize when the Terrence man game is unfolding before your eyes, right? No, you don't have to recognize it, but once it starts unfolding in front of your eyes, make an adjustment for crying out loud. Uh, agreed. I, I just, I do like the idea though of, I, I do want you guys to just sort of rewind our lives, okay, four days. And I want Stugatz at a microphone saying the following before the game happens. Guys, I need you to understand that in tonight's game, Rudy Gobert has to go out because of Terrence Mann. I, I, I see it coming. You got to prepare for all situations, Dan. In the event That's Terrence right. Mann has the game of his life, right. okay, uh, I might have to take Rudy Gobert out. Only if Terrence Mann is 15 of 21. <laughs> Terrence Mann, who told us the story after that game of his phone being on 1% and him thinking about ma allowing the call that was going to invite him to a draft workout to go straight to voicemail, and he would have never gotten into the league. You have to see that coming. In an elimination game, yep. Donovan Mitchell muttering under his breath, he missed six shots. <laughs> And you win today. There is no disputing. Utah's season is over. And what you have now in the Western Conference Finals is Clippers against the Suns. And I wanted to talk about something else that happened. With no Kawhi, no Chris Paul. <laughs> That's correct. Oh, what a disaster. It's not great. <laughs> and I don't know that Suns-Milwaukee is great for the league as a final series. but Clippers box, though, maybe. Clippers Bucks might have some star power, but again, Suns Bucks probably not great for the league. Suns specifically, I'll say this again, would be uh, maybe the most surprising champion in the history of the sport. But what I wanted to ask you about is there was a viral video of a fan, a Suns fan, at the end of the Nugget series where there were two guys who had... Did you see this video of a fight in the stand, Stugatz, between a Suns fan and two Nuggets fans? The two Nuggets fans were standing above the Suns fan. The Suns fan grabs one of them by the shirt, by the neck of the shirt, and just starts wailing on both of them. And Devin Booker sent that fan, clearly won the fight. Not the kind of guy from looking at him that you would think might win the fight if you wanted to judge a book by its cover, but he really did a good job of fighting. Devin Booker sent him tickets to the game and a jersey, but that's not the part that I found fascinating. The part that I found fascinating is the guy who got his ass kicked decided to give an interview. <laughs> and, that a boy. Like, I thought his decision making was bad when he got into the fight, but the giving of an interview where he's he seemed he appears to be wearing three or four watches. I'm not sure whether it was three or four watches. Businessman Dan, you need to know different time zones. What time is it? It's like at a fancy hotel. Did you see the interview, Billy? 
Yeah, it was ridiculous. He <laughs> claims he did not get his ass kicked. <laughs> Just a scratch. I, I don't know that there's ever been a time where I have understood young people less than the granting of that <laughs> granting of that interview. That you are, so well, you're fifteen so, minutes of fame. So Dan. you're so interested in fame that you are going to sit down with your four watches and your scratch nose and your jeans hanging out, uh, uh, revealing your underwear, and you're going to give an interview in which on TikTok. On which you explain that you didn't get your ass kicked when we all saw you got your ass kicked. <laughs> you would be shocked the extremely minute things that go viral on TikTok that then turn people into like TikTok celebrities, Dan. Like I, I could I couldn't even explain it to you if I tried. It is that's what it is now. What did you make of his general aesthetic? Can you guys please help me with because I feel older all the time around here, but I'm watching this interview and I'm thinking to myself, I don't believe in the history of covering sports. I've ever seen someone at the center of this kind of shame say, you know what I'm going to do with this? I'm going to sit down and give an interview in which I deny that I got my ass kicked. <laughs> when, we, when we all saw you get pulled down by your shirt and just hit in the face again and again without rebuttal. <laughs> It's not something I've seen before. <laughs> I'm not an expert on this, but I feel like he would describe his look as having a lot of drip. You know, he's got one of those like purses things, like like a satchel that's like in front of him. So I, I found you, you saw a clip and you retweeted the clip the, the clip online. There's a full eight and a half minute YouTube video of this fan giving an interview. And you're right. His his underpants are hanging out from his from his pants. He's got like three watches on one wrist and one on the other. He's smoking a blunt at the beginning of the interview. It would appear. <laughs> I mean, this guy. <laughs> He's got a lot to his look. There is. Uh, I don't mean to sound like Bill Cosby, but pull your pants up. <laughs> <laughs> I would have followed the Cosby model. Oh, yeah. Oh. Pull your pants up. <laughs> you're giving an important interview on. TikTok. <laughs> You're where why why Jessica are you why is your head in your hands right now? Is it because he didn't pull his pants no, up? No, it's because of referencing Bill Cosby. Yeah. Oh, but I'm it's, right. it's, it's, it's all it's, of it, Dan. It's, it's generally it's, not honestly, a good time it's to be referencing it. Bill Cosby. <laughs> Respectability but, politics. By the way, the uh the description on the YouTube video does not identify his name. It identifies him as Marty in four viral nuggets fan. Parenthetically, <laughs> Marty in four. Marty is it be, in four. Is it because the Suns fan was holding up four fingers yeah. to show the Nuggets were going to be eliminated in four games? So you guys aren't as you're. You guys are not at the same kind of loss I am for the entire thing that that guy was doing after getting his ass kicked and. And just leaning into, with drip, as Chris Cody said, the idea of, I'm going to get my fame or my infamy, it doesn't matter how I get it, even it's even if it means everyone laughing at me, because I'm wearing three watches. <laughs> He's wearing a satchel on set, and his lavalier mic is clipped to his satchel. Yeah, that's funny. Like, that's take funny. your bag off before you do an interview. <laughs> it worked for Mark Sanchez, right? What's he most famous for? Butt fumble. Yeah. Look at him. He's all over the place now. This one doesn't Handsome work guy. for me. This is not good pub for this guy. Wow. This is where Chris this Cody is the draws the line. The line. <laughs> really? You, you'll do anything for you. You got to disappear for a few weeks if you do this guy. <laughs> <laughs> you got to go into hiding. I'm not sure, by the way, Billy, that what you say is so. It worked out for Mark Sanchez. Like, not, well, I did. Mean, I mean, what? That he got jumped? Don't get up sometimes. I mean, okay, Matt, that, that, is not, that is not a ringing success story. I mean, Matt Liner, it has worked out for Matt Liner. Or like you get a few TV appearances, that's the definition of something working out. You just if get you some... ask Matt Liner, would you take the butt fumble? I think he'd say yes. I think Matt Liner would say yes. I think he would too. I mean, when you think of Matt Liner, what do you think of? I think of USC, right? But when you think of Mark Sanchez, what do you think of? But that's all I think of. I think Orlovsky would take the butt fumble too. No, or- Orlovsky's already got a thing. He ran out of the end zone. That's his thing. <laughs> I know. I, I think like, you take the butt oh, fumble. Oh, so you're over saying that. we're doing comparison shopping on running out of the end zone versus butt fumble? No. It's an upgrade. Yeah. yeah. I think, like, you, if the standard is get on, but get great. up sometimes, both of them have parlayed their thing into getting on, get up sometimes. That can't be the standard, people. <laughs> oh, it has like, to be. I have a better standard. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> the standard can't be. <laughs> How does one arrive at success? What do I have to do to get there? 
Let me put a satchel on. Let me put on three watches. Let me not pull up my pants. Someday, maybe I will get up. I will get on, get up sometimes. Can't be the standard. Do better. Wednesdays is good on get up. I like get up. I'm not saying you shouldn't like get up. I'm saying it can't be the standard on, hey, let me have national and international shame getting stuck in an offensive lineman's ass crack and fumbling because 10 years from now, I will get on get up. Is that better or worse, though? Because Olavsky gave up two points as opposed to the butt fumble where he just gave nah, up possession. No, it's better. It's better. No, it was a touchdown, wasn't it? No, it was not a touchdown. A safety, he, he ran yeah. out of the end zone, and it was a it was a safety. He did not know the yeah, size. Yeah, he gave up two points. Yes, it was, no, I mean, I mean the butt fumble wasn't wasn't it returned? Oh yes, for a, I believe that was returned for but a it's touchdown. Absolutely worse then, <laughs> and, so and a lot worse. And what ended up happening after that? A lot better, I, uh, Jessica. The math you're doing there is odd because I don't think people, when they're sort of looking at Arlovsky and and Sanchez, there are saying, "Was it worth seven points or two points?" It's just shame that his, minus five it's, plus <laughs> minus. <laughs> <laughs> my plus minus five on shame. Five points worse than So this is what happened headed into the tunnel as Mark Sanchez, who, as we've said, has shaken all this off and gotten on get up a couple of times. This is what was <laughs> happening around him as the Jets ran to the tunnel at halftime down 34 nothing at home to the Patriots. Snyder has to say thank you, doesn't he? Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> what kind of monster doesn't say thank you when someone helpfully offers you some lip balm that also, you aggressively grab? To question the technique on the lip balm, I feel like you're doing more damage to your lips by rubbing it that aggressively than the lip balm will cover. Wow. A shocking take from you. Perhaps you too will one day sometimes get on Get Up. <laughs> you can carve out that lane for yourself. Are we sure that Quinn Snyder has lips? Put it on the poll. <laughs> That's a great question. Put it on the poll, Billy. Are you sure that Quinn Snyder has lips? I'm still stuck on Billy praising Wednesdays on Get Up. Yeah. Like specifically, specifically Wednesdays. He was like, yeah. I love watching Wednesdays. What's, about Wednesdays? Wednesdays. What's going on with Hump Day? Yeah. I was going to say, I was gonna say, Billy's praising Wednesdays. It's the only day we're not recording right now, so it's the only oh, day maybe. he watches okay. it. That's a good point, yeah. What happens on Wednesdays, Billy? It's just good. Wednesdays are good on Get Up. Have you guys not seen Wednesdays on Get Up? No, no. no. Tell us about it. I-Y-K-Y-K. K I Y K Y. I hate those. You know what I mean? When people do those on the internet, I don't like those. Yeah. That's my take. It's better than Billy's, which is just to yeah. throw that fish on our lap and give us nothing in the way of elaboration and just stare at us. What is the acronym? I love that I love that on Get Up we have it on the televisions here. Like day after, like the NBA gave us so much this weekend. And we're still doing on a get up Monday. Overreaction to a tongue of Iloa through five interceptions in practice. Overreaction, underreaction. No. Ooh, which wow. was it? Yeah. I believe Dan Graziano said it was an overreaction. No way. <laughs> Magic Johnson is now on Get Up, and he is only saying super obvious things. Correct? <laughs> like that's that's what we're doing. Magic Johnson in studio say obvious things. I'd actually be interested in what it is that he's saying about Ben Simmons. I don't know if he is discussing that, but I'd be interested if Magic has anything enlightening. On Why ben would you think we, that Magic Johnson would? Such do you not have point. enough experience? It is such a really? Point. You're you're waiting. So let just help me understand what you're doing. I you're, realize that point. Through. You're staring at the television right now, and what you're waiting for is enlightenment. You are going to be sadly disappointed, my friend. I did just see a pantomime left hook J, like a little a little baby hook for Magic there. So maybe he's saying that he needs to implement a little baby hook. A little low his post game? I think Magic Johnson's advice to Ben Simmons would be as helpful as Shaq's, which is don't be afraid. Or I'll punch you in the face. <laughs> <laughs> that is, what were you looking for? Enlightenment or illumination from Magic Johnson? It's, it seems like a bad idea when the guy is famous for only saying the most obvious of things and then smiling. It seems like you would get the opposite of whatever enlightenment is.
I have a question for Stugatz. Stugatz, how would you have felt about Doc if he would have pulled Ben Simmons and he wouldn't have played like the second half? And then they ask him why, and then he gives the exact same quote. Where he's like, I don't know if that's someone that could win a championship as a point guard. Uh, I would have been okay with that. I mean, he's being honest, and he's giving his team the best chance, the best opportunity to win that series. That's what a, a coach is supposed to do. I think you, you that, say, that you, should be the coach's chief st- responsibility. St- st- you say that? I understand that you say right. that. but Easier it, said than done. No, I understand no, no, that, No, it's not Dan. even easier said than done. If I had said to you, Stugatz, before the series started, is there a way that the Sixers are given the best chance of winning by not playing Ben Simmons? Your answer would not have been yes. Stugatz. It wouldn't have been. Now, he's the worst free throw shooter in the history of the sport in the playoffs, statistically. But your answer simply, if I'd asked you after the Washington series, right. hey, Stugatz, is that, what's the circumstance under which the best opportunity for the Sixers to win is don't play Ben Simmons? You're not saying, hey, for the first time ever in basketball, I'm going to see a player evaporate with his courage, and I'm going to see a guy who is scared and appear to be a coward in front of me that's what i predict and therefore they should just be playing anyone george hill would be fine no but dan you're asking me before the series or before the game it's hard to predict that but once it's actually happening you have to make the in-game adjustment that's all i'm saying when it's actually happening right in front of your face and the season's on the line take the guy out that's simple agreed but you say it's that simple and that's the part where i stop you it's not that simple in like, the flow of a game it should be that simple you, like hey i'm the head coach you're not playing well get out if, you're hurting it, us if, more than you're helping okay, us if it's that simple why did two guys who ostensibly know more about coaching in the nba than you do quinn snyder and doc rivers even though doc rivers has some real strong blemishes on his resume if it's that simple that afterward doc rivers can be asked is he a championship point guard and he says i don't know if it's that simple why did they not do it um, it's the difficult thing to do, obviously. But then why are you saying it's simple? Because, Dan, it should be that simple. Doc Rivers is in his first season as the Sixers coach. He has job security. He's not going anywhere. And when you're in the game, you have to make that adjustment. I'm not saying it's easy, but you have to pull Ben aside and you, say, hey, this is why I'm doing you it. You are you're saying not it's giving easy, us a good though. chance. You're saying it's simple. Dan, it should be easy for Doc Rivers. I'm not saying, like, I would sit here and do it. Like, you have to manage whatever it is you're saying to Ben Simmons on the front end and explain to him why it is you're doing it and then just do it and don't worry about what happens after the game your season's over again Stugatz I will say you get to win all the arguments as it relates to the results of Utah and the Sixers but what I'm telling you is to my untrained amateur eye compared to these coaches I'm watching as Rudy Gobert keeps getting stuck under the basket and Terrence Mann keeps killing them with jumpers. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, there's not a change here. There's nothing changing here. They are continuing to do this thing where they rely on their best players, which is a pretty safe thing to do throughout the history of that sport until it evolves so quickly right in front of your eyes that we all notice at the same time, wait a minute, the three-time defensive player of the year is useless in this situation. So useless that a nobody is about to end their season. And the coach, who's allegedly an expert in these matters, can't pull the trigger on it. Won't pull the trigger on it. He's watching the same thing I am, which is these are open jumpers that every guy in this league can make from three now. He did a terrible job. I mean, I'm sorry. He's a coward. What do you want from me? Quinn Snyder's a coward. Yeah, Dan, that's a terrible job. Your season is on the line. Rudy Gobert should not be guarding Terrence Mann. You have Joe Ingles on the bench. You have Clarkson on the bench. You have other guys on the bench who could fill that role. That's a terrible job by Quinn Snyder. I mean. But these are organizational decisions. Like, Quinn Snyder's not making this decision independent of himself. If in this summer, let's say Daryl Morey wants to trade Ben Simmons, he was probably pissed off last night at Doc Rivers acknowledging that he might not be able to win a championship with him. He's got to try and trade him and get the most possible. And politically, 
there was a time early in the season when James Harden was asking out of Houston that there was a chance that Philly was going to trade Ben Simmons for James Harden, and there was some debate over whether or not they wanted to include him. Earlier this season, they were deciding, maybe we don't want James Harden because we want to keep Ben Simmons. He's 24. We've got him under contract. So, like, these are kind of fireable offenses in a way all around. And if you're Daryl Morey, you want to preserve something so when you trade him for 60 cents on the dollar, it doesn't look so bad. You're going to have a hard time throughout the history of that sport, Stugatz, finding anywhere in that sport Examples for me of my second best guy don't want to play him in critical spots. In the deep in the playoffs, you're not. Gonna, I mean, your second best guy is a guy who can't hit free throws and can't hit a three, and is your primary ball handler. It's Simmons and Gobert, <laughs> and I'm telling you that you're asking for something. It's easy to ask for in retrospect. I'm not. I am not saying that they made the right decision. You get to win all the arguments today. You're going to have a hard time finding for me in the history of that sport in the playoffs any examples. And you got two here in Simmons and Gobert, where the best course of action is your second. I'm going to sit Pippen. I got to sit him. I got to sit him. He's my second best guy. He's the guy I'm paying all the money. I'm sorry. The mismatches are such. Nope. Get off the court. I can't use you here. I'd rather have George Hill. I'd rather have Jordan Clarkson. Right. I mean, I'm certain there are examples. I don't have them off the top it's, of my head. It's not there very have easy. to be a few, I, though. It's not very easy, and if you can find me outliers, it's still not very easy to find in that sport the examples of my second. Hell, look at what the Nets did with James Harden, who shouldn't have been out there. Like, he couldn't move, and the Nets are still playing him 40 goddamn minutes a game. because, And he can't blow by anybody because he's he's your second best guy. And, and you're not going to trust Joe Harris, because you saw what happened to Joe Harris when it was 111-111 and the best three-point shooter in the league had a wide-open three when everyone's legs were dead because you trust your best guys in that sport. Like, throughout the history, you're... I'm, I'm, you well, are James not- Harden, I mean, you're comparing James Harden to, to Ben Simmons and Rudy Gobert. The threat of James Harden being out there is enough. Like, it just so is. God, you're making fun of Ben Simmons. I mean, and getting I, I, 22 points, you're, James But Harden. you're making fun... He was terrible in that series. I know he was terrible, so God, but the threat of him being out there is is I, it, it's equally it's more important than Rudy Gobert being out there for the Jazz. If I before <laughs> that series just played out, I had asked you what's a better thing to bet on: Ben Simmons being good or injured James Harden being good, healthy Ben Simmons or injured James Harden. Like you're making these arguments, Stugatz, and I understand. I think I take an injured James Harden. I mean, I mean that's what you're saying now because of what you just saw in that series. But I've never seen what I just saw in that series from Ben Simmons, and you can evidently predict when Ben Simmons is going to short circuit and when Terrence Mann is going to be better than Rudy Gobert. Again, I'm not saying I could predict it, but when it happens, your job as a coach is to make an adjustment. No one can see it. No one can predict it. But when it happens, do something about it. Like, Ben Simmons ain't going to do anything about it. He's going to go out there and play and hide in a corner. But if Stu Gatz, if I said to you, ahead of a series between Utah and the Clippers, you're facing Kawhi, you're facing Paul George, and if I offered you the choice, this series comes down to whether Terrence Mann can beat you in a game, you'd be like, yeah, I'll take those odds. Like, like it, the, the whole thing is picking on weaknesses. That's what Gobert and Simmons are. In theory, Terrence Mann should be a weakness to the Clippers. Okay. And, and, like, even if it's happening for 24 minutes, do you expect it to happen for 48? Like, I think at some point you got to make a choice, which is, yeah, Ter- Terrence Mann's going to beat me. You tell me that before the series, and of course I'm going to take my chances. But when he's actually beating me, I have to make an adjustment. You, you say that, and I understand why you're saying that, and I thought this during the Nets game as Blake Griffin kept getting these wide-open threes. I thought to myself, Milwaukee will live with their season ending if Blake Griffin hits eight threes. And then Stugatz will come on the next day and say, you got to make an adjustment. You can't let like, Blake Griffin beat you on threes. And and you will win the argument. But I'm I'm watching Blake Griffin take threes from the top of the key. He made a couple. And I'm like, and if, if Milwaukee loses that way, they will absolutely lose. They will take that result and all the criticism that endures in the offseason if the way they lose is betting on the probabilities that Blake Griffin will stop hitting those threes. And their season ended betting that Terrence Mann wasn't going to beat them. 
I can't. He beat him. I, he did. He yeah. did. He, he absolutely did. Bad bet. It, it is a bad bet, and it's why Stugatz will win forevermore after the team has lost, because then he comes in the next day and says, well, Kevin Durant, I was with him all along. <laughs> I, I was I, I was right about Kevin Durant. He now Dur- knows that, I, I, Kevin. I, I, yes. yes, Kevin Durant yes. now goes into the offseason knowing, look at how happy he's, look at Stugatz, leaning in his chair. Albert a friend out, le- man. Yes, be- belly out. I was, yes, I was his <laughs> wingman throughout. I never doubted you, Kevin. I love that the whole specter of the Durant conversation is Durant to somehow in the chase of Stugatz's respect. It is great. <laughs> there's be- better than championships. Stu got his respect. But you know what's funny about that Whittingham is he is not Stu Gotts actually, but the Twitter egg representing Stu it, it, it is. It's why he left Golden State. The Golden State would have been, for me. Win, would yeah. have been win, winning championships for a decade. Instead, he decides, you know what? I need to leave somewhere else. And just so Stu Gotts doesn't think it's for him, I'm going to go to Brooklyn just to bother him. But it's for Stu Gotts. I'm not going to go to the Knicks. Put this on the poll as well, Billy, please. At level Batard show. What's more embarrassing, getting swept in the playoffs or winning one game in the playoffs and celebrating in the streets? <laughs> Closing down traffic in New York City. We did that. 